Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Akronos CyberProtect virtual conference. Thank you all so much for joining us here today. We've got a great uh, couple of keynote speakers uh, starting us off today, as well as a fantastic panel. A couple of housekeeping items before we get started here. First off, the session will be recorded, so you do have the ability to share that with colleagues uh, and partners and customers. And the, you will be on mute during the session as well. We will have a Q&A set up, so please enter your questions into the chat. We'll do a short Q&A with our CEO following his keynote presentation. Um, I'm Pat Hurley, I am your MC for this part of the session. We'll give you a quick overview of the agenda and then we'll get right into uh, Sergey's keynote. But first off, uh, we will have our founder and CEO, Sergey Balusa. He's also the founder and, um, of uh, Schaffhausen Institute of Technology, a research-based institute based in Schaffhausen, Switzerland, followed by Frank Dickinson, who's the program manager uh, at IDC. Uh, so right now I will kick it over to our founder and CEO, Sergey Belusa, for his first keynote session. Take it away, Sergey. This is a presentation which I have generally shown uh, 100 times. So if you've seen it, you will have to bear with some standard slides. But much of the content is relevant to today and is new. So first of all, about Acronis. Acronis is a global leader in cyber protection which is artificial um, intelligence powered protection, cyber cloud and cyber platform. We are headquartered in Schaffhausen, uh, Switzerland, where I am right now. I'm Singaporean and uh, we have a second headquarter in the Singapore, um, in Suntec City, uh, from where we run our international business. It is important for us to be Swiss and Singaporean at the same time. Uh, both countries are very, very stable very well managed, as you can see, even how the disease was managed, COVID-19. Uh, very, very friendly to everybody, uh, economically stable and very developed. And the fact that we have dual headquarters gives us additional ability to protect you. I assume many of you are in many countries. And so the fact that you can do business with both Switzerland and Singapore at all times and can be confident on uh, being here is very useful, especially when it comes to protection. Acronis is a medium-sized company. We are growing very rapidly. We are a multi-hundred million dollar company. And with our new products, we are growing extremely rapidly overall, and especially in our cloud business. We are very broadly used in uh, almost every Fortune 1000 company. We have over 50,000 partners who have done business with us, over half a million businesses using our products and about 5.5 million consumers. We believe in global local presence. We believe in um, giving protection uh, to every uh, person in every country. We believe it's a thief's uh, human need and it's a basic human right. And so with our 1.5 thousand employees, we're based in 33 locations. Uh, we have done business in 150 countries last year and this year. We support 33 languages and expect to extend our support to more languages and more equal support across all languages. And even our data centers, where, which is one of the options where you can send your data are present uh, in, in the next 12 months in 100 countries. It's present in 15 countries today. Uh, with that, I want to point out that um, as we noticed, especially now, the world is uh, becoming rapidly completely dependent on digital processes. And digital processes are conducted in bits, zeros and ones. And those bits are uh, extremely easy to use, but at the same time, they're very easy to break and they're very easy to copy. And so they need protection. And protection is becoming very challenging because first of all, there is very, very large number of systems. We believe there is about 50 billion uh, workloads to be protected globally. And this number will go 10x over the next 10 years. And so it could be very complex. And these workloads pr to protect, they are based in 1,000 locations. Uh, very rapidly, every person and every business have growing number of workloads, number of locations we have to protect them. We also see that the cost is very uh, big challenge because not only the number of devices is growing, but also the amount of data is growing 10x, at least 10x over 10 years. And so anything you pay per gigabyte or per device can become very, very expensive and very expensive to manage. 
then security is becoming a reality of life. Now, security is not something which happens to uh, somebody in the newspaper, but it happens to your friend, to your partner, to your company, to yourself. And that is because uh, that the crime, cybercrime is becoming industrialized. Cyber criminals use all the latest tools to build bad um, security exploits. And it's becoming organized. We believe there is around 300,000 new security threats every day. So everything is being attacked. Then privacy is becoming a major problem because now every piece of data about your business and about yourself is available in a digital form and it can be exploited to manipulate you whether it comes to your purchase decisions, to your personal decisions or to your political decisions. And more importantly, especially with COVID-19, what we've learned is we cannot really function without IT. So we believe IT is fifth basic need, just like uh, water, air, and uh, home uh, sh shelter. It's a fifth basic need where if IT is off, you cannot actually have food or shelter or air uh, or water uh, in some cases. Now, that uh, only is possible to resolve with a solution which we propose. Our mission is to protect all data applications and systems, and we believe such protections need to be integrated and completely autonomous. And as such, we need to make sure that uh, we provide you protection from all five vectors of possible problems with your IT infrastructure safety, so nothing is lost. There is always a copy of everything. Accessibility, now you can access anything from anywhere, even in case your system is down, your network is down, privacy, making sure that you know who has access to your system and to your data. Authenticity, making sure that you know the difference between original and a copy. Uh, security, uh, protection against all uh, bad guys attacking you. And again, we believe that you can only be successful by making it in a one integrated package. Only that way you get to the required um, uh, benefits, ease of use, total cost of ownership, security control and reliability. Without it, you cannot scale with number of workloads, with an amount of data, with number of threats and other um, challenges. Uh, with cyber, um, with COVID-19, we've learned what it means to have biological um, uh, protection. And there is a lot of similarities between protecting biological system and um, computer system. In case of COVID-19, we learned that we need to do prevention, we need to do uh, social distancing, healthy lifestyle, we need to do detection, super important to do detection, making sure that we have tests. We need to respond uh, by healthcare system, by some treatment, by antiviral drugs, hopefully in the future. Uh, we need to um, be able to recover. For some patients in COVID-19, it takes long time to recover, and that's what loads our hospital and represents a major threat for health. And finally, we need to do forensic to be able to figure out how to do prevention, how to actually quarantine not all the population of the country, but only those people who are actually, uh, actually sick, and yet how to quarantine all the people who are potentially spreading disease. Actually, it is absolutely the same with digital threats. With digital threats, you also need to do prevention. Most important is to keep your IT infrastructure healthy and make it sure that it's, um, it's assessed and it's managed and it's set up in such way that the attack or the problem is least likely. You need to do detection in case some attacks are happening in real time, respond in real time if possible, if not possible, do recovery, and always being able to do forensic. If you cannot do forensic, you cannot really figure out what happened and if you cannot figure out what happened, you cannot prevent it from happening again. You cannot detect it while it's happening again. You cannot respond it at the time when you detect it and so on and so forth. And we believe one more time, the only way to go is to go about it, to do it for all the vectors of acronym cyber, SAPAS, safety, accessibility, privacy, authenticity, and security at the same time. There is no actually other way for you to stay safe with your workload. You have to have it in a single package, single agent, single user interface, single policy, and single technology. Only that way it really works in such ways that's easy, easy enough and uh, cost effective enough for you to be able to manage. Now, with Acronis, that's exactly what we do. We provide a solution which uh, we um, uh, do. All we do for customers is autonomous, integrated, modular cyber protection. 
So cyber protection for customers available both as on premise as an as a cloud service. What we are releasing today is a chronic cyber protect 15, which is uh, again available as on premise as a cloud service through our classic channel. Uh, our channel uses a chronic cloud as cyber cloud. Today, service providers in the future, both service providers and classic resellers to offer cyber protection to customers. We make cyber protection into a open platform. Acronis cyber platform is an open platform which allows our partners to in customers to extend, integrate and customize cyber cloud for their needs or cyber protection for the needs of customers. It is based on our built by Acronis cyber infrastructure, which is what we use in Acronis cyber data centers and we will make available in over 3,000 partner data centers for you to be able to choose where you have your protection compute and storage. And we actually augment and extend it for Acronis Cyber Services, specifically Acronis Cyber Fit Academy for partners and customers, but also other services for partners and other services for customers to make it complete. And, and that's actually, this slide describes what we do. Never mind, never mind you use our classic product or you use our cloud product or you sell our classic product, you sell our cloud product. It's really one offer today. Now, I want to stop on several uh, important um, uh, things, important notes about our product. So first of all, all of our technology are based on a chronic cyber engine, which is our autonomous engine, which is our unique innovation. We have over 300 patents we are filing every year over 75 patents, which is a very large number for a company of our size. And this is cyber learning, cyber autonomous engine, which is not only uh, automatically uh, analyzing the DC, you know, anomalies in what happens on your computer on a computer similar to yours, but also it is autonomously figuring out what is happening on the different other sources of data and autonomously enhancing itself and actually making actions, not just reporting it to you or to, to, uh, to a system administrator which manages your workload or to MSP, but it actually makes the actions by itself. The engine, which is very important part of our offer, is equally well working on a connected and disconnected workloads. Of course, most of our computers are connected to internet at all times, but sometimes those connections are not perfect and sometimes you are disconnected. Nevertheless, you're disconnected or nevertheless, you have a slow connection. You have to be fully protected. Nobody of our competitors have the full protection working without internet connection. Um, then uh, our cyber autonomous engine is based on technology which we call a chronic cyber bus. Our value proposition is not that we just like many of our competitors providing part of SAPAS in the uh, form of multiple products but it is actually a single agent, single user interface and single policy. And so to get this integration, we have a unique technology which we built painfully over the past 10 years, which we call a chronic cyber bus. And because of that, um, all of these advantages of cyber engine are working across not just security, but also safety, accessibility, privacy and authenticity at the same time, and we analyze events, not only related to security problems, but also related to the health of your system, of the system which is similar to yours, of your hard disk, of your other parts of your system, of your operating system, of your patch level, using all the data available to us, and we collect the data for tens of millions of data sources. So today we're releasing a chronic cyber protect, which is all in one protection designed for IT potential, but, uh, professionals. What is the main difference in comparison to what we have released in the past? In the past, the company was releasing first passive backup and then active backup. And now we're releasing for the first time a chronic cyber protect. There is really these differences on the slide. First of all, it's an integrated proactive, active and reactive protection in one package. And again, this is not just for security. And it's not just for uh, backup, but it's across backup, disaster recovery, vulnerability assessment, patch management, uh, security, privacy management, authenticity management. Uh, all of this is proactive, active, and reactive. So we, first of all, we are trying to assess and manage your, your patch level and your configuration to avoid possible failures. You really don't want to need to be protected. You want everything to work. You want to be impenetrable. Then at all the time, 
in a real time, we've monitored what is happening with your machine. And again, it doesn't come just only for security purposes, but also we monitor what happens with your operating system level, with users which are <coughs> going around in your machine, which might be a legitimate users for privacy, what is happening with your uh, hardware. And, and then um, in real time, we can actually make changes and avoid the failure in real time. And then if we couldn't avoid the failure in real time, we can do a very quick automatic restore. Now, it's important that we do not believe that it is uh, forever now possible that there will be a situation when you actually manage a single workload. Almost nobody on this call, I'm pretty sure, uh, is actually having a single, um, uh, single uh, workload. Almost everybody in this call, oh, I'm pretty sure, uh, is actually managing <clears throat> uh, multiple workloads and in the future managing actually hundreds of workloads um, in, in a single, um, in a, from a single set. And, and so you really need to be fully integrated and CyberProtect is designed for productivity and efficiency of IT professional, whether it's IT professional at a managed service provider, classic reseller or in-house system administrator. I wanted to stop a bit on Acronis CyberProtect security, which is for the first time we are releasing fully blown security product. And it's not just fully blown security product, but it's a complete set of integrated security products in one package. It includes core anti-malware technology, which is relatively standard, but we have a number of advanced new generation things like artificial intelligence based static analyzer, dynamic behavioral protection, and other things. It is advanced artificial intelligence based technology with autonomous cyber engine and many other things. It includes preventive technology. One very important thing about preventive technology, uh, which we have vulnerability assessment and patch management and configuration management, it doesn't in, in, in exist in a vacuum. It actually exists in consideration of what the rest of the security and the rest of the protection does. Now, we do not believe that it is longer possible to have a protection which does not include management. And so we have security management as a part of the package you have to manage your machine. The most important way for you to avoid security problems is not to run some kind of antivirus software only, which is of course what we provide, but to configure your system to minimize possible problems and to be able to recover. And for that, we have integrated backup. With that, we believe we have unique advantages with complete integrated and autonomous endpoint protection. So first of all, we have automatic instant recovery of any amount of data which is on your system. So damaged files, if they're damaged by anything, can be recovered from local cache, from local backup, or from cloud backup. Nobody else is able to do it automatically. There is no package which allows you to do it automatically. And there is always a limitation, number of files and size of files. There are people who do it with one gigabyte of files, there are people who do it with 500 megabyte, 50 megabyte. All of this is very, very small. Many of us have today many files on our file system which are larger than many gigabytes. Then we do not depend on connectivity. Very important, especially in the countries in Asia, is that in many places connectivity is not always. And in fact, what the bad guy can do, it can come to your system and switch off productivity or make it very slow in order to then attack your system. And our autonomous AI-based engine works in real time without connectivity. None of our competitors do it in a full fashion. They always require at all time connection to cloud-based detection engine, and otherwise they cannot really protect your system. Forensic data and backups. We can store metadata and memory dumps sufficient for you to do full forensic investigation. And so as a result, if something happens, you immediately have enough data to investigate, and you immediately can figure out what happened and avoid it from happening again. Nobody else can do it. There are some EDR solution and they source certain types of events, but not the data with these events. You can, do, you can use the data with EDR solutions, but it's not sufficient. The bad guys, the real bad guys, as you will see from subsequent slides, easily finds a way to walk it around. Then we provide application level protection. Because we run on the machine, we can use AI on very fine grain level and actually protect you on a fine grain level, not just protect the system. They, the bad guys are no longer actually attacking you on the system level. They are application specific. And finally, we have multi-layer detection, which I will describe on multiples on, on the next slide, 
which you are protected in multiple level. So again, this is our protection funnel. So um, it's a unique funnel. We have unique expertise and low level IO both in memory and in uh, hard disk. And as such, we can protect you on very low level. We can protect you against things uh, uh, like um, new malware technique like replace, which is using symlinks to encrypt files to evade discovery by all these guys here. We protect you against malware evasive techniques working with low level data. And very important part of what we do, agent and backups are self-protected. They're hidden from the bad guys. It's a single agent for security and for backup, and we're hidden from the bad guy. He cannot find us, he cannot switch us off. So if you look at our protection panel, it's absolutely unique in being combined. Nobody else provides you all these levels of protection in a single package. On top, you have vulnerability assessment and patch management, which are also AI-driven and very broad. URL filtering to stop browser, like exploit prevention, cloud reputation analysis, anti-malware engines can include in signature-based prevention, AI-based static analyzer, if something is not caught by Z, data protection, heuristics, behavioral protection, which we constantly enhance, and we believe we have the best-in-class behavioral protection today. And, and then we can uh, figure out the critical areas for fileless threats, especially with our ability to scan backups. And if not, it's important that we're self-protected so the bad guys did not switch us off and you can always recover from backup. Let me demonstrate it on a few examples. One of the <coughs> famous examples is Wasted Locker uh, attack on Garmin. Garmin actually is also based in Schaffhausen. I'm sure many people on this call use Garmin uh, watches and I'm sure many people have seen Garmin in their navigation. What is even more interesting in Garmin used almost in all commercial aviation for navigation. And so that wonderful company, which is actually not a new company, extremely well run, produces extremely high products, was attacked by Wasted Locker. And, and it, it was not able to protect itself. It, it has used, we believe, CrowdStrike and, and Commvault. And so here, um, we would have stopped anti malware uh, uh, this protection on, on the anti malware engine scan level. Then our AI static analyzer would have stopped it, if not malware engine scan layer would have stopped it then our behavioral protection would have stopped it. And in fact, if none of this would have helped, we could have recovered from backup. So if you look at mains ransomware, this is an example of, a real example of a sample of infected nine machines in Xerox. There were two they which were not patched sufficiently and they were made inoperable. And if you look at Acronis Cyber Protect, all nine machines would have been recovered immediately. Those were patched. The two machines would have to be restored from the cloud with about one hour delay. So you can think about one hour of business for two machines lost, which we estimate of about $100 loss. If you would have used CrowdStrike and Commvault, and Commvault does have immutable backups. Many of our competitors confuse you that having an immutable backup is enough. In reality, the bad guy can get into the Commvault, get into the storage, and if they do, they switch off immutability of backups or make sure that your backups don't work for long enough time. So in, in this case, ransomware would not be detected. So detection was not available for 25 days. All the 11 machines would be locked out and you would have lost 33 hours downtime and 88 hours recovery time. We estimate the loss of about $6,000. And then the real life situation of using a relatively simplistic um, security engine like WebRoot, albeit working for on the market for a long time, and using very popular Veeam backup, which doesn't have self-protection and doesn't have immutable backups, ransomware would not be detected. All 11 machines would be locked out. All the backups would be deleted um, and, and um, you will have to pay the ransom. And so we, we would estimate that it uh, will be very long time and will be about $200,000 of cost. Now, uh, let me just give you another example. This is a recent uh, ransomware, Ragnar Locker, CLOP, and Doppel Paymeyer. So Acronis would have detected and stopped all of this at, at a, in a moment. And one more time, if for any chance you would have had a ransomware, which would have encrypted some files on your machine, uh, then, uh, then in that case, uh, we would have been able to recover from backup. It wouldn't be necessary for these guys. Now, if you look at the slide, there is only uh, one vendor who actually detects um, uh, the Ragnar Locker beside us, which is Bitdefender. But Bitdefender is not doing well with Slop and Doppel by Meyer, where we actually detect all of that. Again, the most important threat today 
the most expensive threat today, the most likely threat today for you and your customers and your workloads is ransomware. And Acronis has the best solution today. Now, we believe in providing complete solution for endpoint and edge point. We, provide to, we believe in providing a single product which includes all aspects of security. And so this is a very simple comparison with two competitors, Semantic and WebRoot. And today we have a better solution. And within next two quarters, and if you buy CyberProtect, it is a subscription-based product. So if you just use it, you will get all those things for free. We will provide you data leak prevention, endpoint detection and response, zero trust assessment and management in one package. And two unique things, Cyber Protection Recovery Manager, which helps you to recover in automatic and easy fashion, and Cyber Protection Forensic Manager. All of this is either available or coming very soon we are testing it, and, and so, again, it's the best protection today, and it's by far the best protection in the near future, which is confirmed by the top security alliances. We have very new product. The product is uh, available on the market as a cloud service for about six months. Nevertheless, we're already in the top uh, tests and top certification and security alliances, which are listed here, and we will be in top three, top five, and every list every list and every certification over the next six months. It's a focus of our marketing. So, you know, really, uh, what can you do? One thing which you launch together with this initiative is a CyberFit score. And so you can get your CyberFit score by going to go.acronis.com slash score, download a free tool and assess your device. Uh, and we intend to do CyberFit scoring for workload, for customers, also for partners being ready to protect customers and been ready to offer our products, CyberFit countries, also to test our and our partner network and infrastructure to be able to protect customers and partners. And we're going to continuously promote it without our CyberFit sport partners, which all use CyberProtect already today. Williams Racing and Formula One, Manchester City, Liverpool, uh, Arsenal, Neo, over 80 sport teams, which will aggressively promote CyberFit and aggressively use CyberFit in sports, there is no um, uh, allocation for downtime. And so you have to be always on to be able to win. And so with that, what do you need to do? What's your next step? So we'll really, there is this just simple steps, get your CyberFit score. It is free. You can just see whether your machine is protected or not. And it will explain to you how the score is calculated uh, and the maximum score is 800. You can download the product. The product is free to download. You can install it on your devices, Acronis Cyber Protect on any of your devices. Most of the devices, most of the work workloads we cover with Cyber Protect, Windows, Mac, VMware, Hyper-V, and so on and so forth. You, if you are a partner or if you are IT professional, you can go and get automatically trained in Acronis Cyber Academy with Acronis Cyber Protect capabilities. And again, here is URL where you can see the demo and go to the training. I suggest that you consider protecting every workload around you, being penetrated and being broken, no matter how unimportant the workload may look to you, whether it's a home machine or your child machine, whether it's a secondary home machine, you don't want to have anything broken or stolen in your home or in your office. And another thing which I highly encourage our classic partners to consider and something which we push is to actually consider not only offering our product in a classic fashion, which is the product we're launching today, but also to become a Cronin Cyber Protect MSP and offer it as a managed service to your partners, customers, and workloads. So thank you very much for listening. I hope you like the product and the rest of the presentation. A Cronin Cyber Engine, which is core of uh, the capabilities of our technology. So the first part of a Cronin Cyber Engine is uh, um, actually cyber learning. Cyber learning is relatively standard thing today uh, there is no longer possible to respond to threats um, which happen in, with, with your devices with uh, uh, standard analyst-based um, security solutions. Uh, there are about 300 new uh, cyber threats, 300,000 new cyber threats every day. There's a new cyber threat happening every second. And um, uh, so in order to be able to be ready, uh, you have to automate the collection of the information, you would have to automate the enforcement and you have to adapt to this new situation automatically. Now, there, there is <clears throat> another thing which is uh, cyber autonomous, which is very, very unique feature of Acronis solution, 
where it's really we're talking about two things. One of them is uh, the fact that um, uh, we believe that our technology must uh, execute equally well in a connected workloads and disconnected workloads. And um, we built our technology in such ways that even in case your device has a very slow connection and very, very, uh, and even disconnected from the internet, uh, we can still learn and improve the way how we catch anomalies in the behavior of your workload without the internet connection, without the connection to our lab. More importantly, we believe there are many parts of um, our cloud product which, and our cloud brain product, which um, actually analyzes uh, in real time information we collect from various devices and from various sources of information about the threats, and not only um, uh, respond to threats better, but improve itself and improve the engine on the device. Very important part of everything we do is that we believe that nothing is going to be um, uh, in one place in the future. And um, it will be more and more important to have your protection infrastructure close to yourself. And so it's very important that all of our technology uh, can be deployed in Acronis data centers, can be deployed in partner data centers, can be deployed at customer premise. It can be a combination or it can be a duplication of the above. And we can integrate with the in-house systems uh, very well. Then Acronis Cyberbus is our uh, very special integration technology. We believe that the only way to deal with the complexity which is coming our way with a huge number of devices, which are not only increasing in number, but also increasing number of locations and also increasing in, in the importance, <clears throat> they, we shall uh, also see that the only way to deal with it is to actually integrate different parts of um, the uh, cyber protection together and not only relating to our technology, but also to third party technology, which is needed to augment our protection. And then finally, again, very important thing is that our engine collects metadata and events across uh, all of the different vectors of uh, Acronis Cyber SAPAS, safety, accessibility, privacy, and security. For example, uh, we not only protect you from uh, the ransomware, but we also protect you from hard disk failure. We also protect you from software failure. We also protect you from installing a bad patch. Uh, not only we protect you against uh, um, uh, your IT infrastructure against the cyber virus, but as we've learned with uh, COVID-19, we have to know about the biological viruses, or for example, uh, with about the um, events which happen um, um, about natural disasters. So natural disasters also affect your infrastructure. In fact, even political events can affect your infrastructure. And so you have to be protected and you have to be aware and your infrastructure have to be ready to respond to any threat. It really doesn't matter what is the reason for infrastructure to go down. And so our uh, cyber engine is uh, operating across of these vectors. Uh, with that, I wanted to talk about Acronis Cyber Protect, which is our new product. Acronis Cyber Protect 15 is what we're launching today for the first time as an on-premise product. And so this product is really multiple things. So first of all, uh, it is um, an, an sort of a next generation Acronis Cyber Backup. It's really superior backup. And it's superior because it includes proactive and active protection, not just reactive protection. So we actually uh, enhance standard vulnerability assessment and patch management um, you know, specifications, which is primarily focused on security to um, assess the system and to figure out what needs to be done to the system from the standpoint of patch and configuration management to avoid downtime. We can do things like a, a removal of malware from backups, which is very important. You know, a lot of the signature antivirus technologies catch uh, very old viruses. And now you would think, why would you catch old viruses? They don't longer exist in the internet. Well, they don't, but they might exist in your backup. So you might actually bring them back like the viruses from Mammoth when you restore old backup. We also prefer recurring infection. So again, very important that when you re re actually restore something, it is by definition an older patch level. And so it's very important to patch your system with the latest patches to avoid to be immediately affected again. 
Now, another thing which is very important is uh, active protection. And active protection allows you to see that something's going on on the computer. And instead of waiting for it to fail and then uh, restore it from backup, uh, you can switch on continuous data protection. And in some cases, you can uh, watch what is happening and stop it and then do an automatic, very quick mini restore. Most importantly, we proactively protect uh, the agent and backup storage. And of course, we have uh, standard SINs and reactive protection, and there are many new SINs in that as well. Um, we always think about the productivity for IT pros. So for any IT pro, we provide um, uh, integrated cyber protection management. So it's not only possible to restore, but you can actually access the computer and configure it after restore or access it and start the restore. And um, we provide special protection plan for remote workers, which is much easier. And we also have automatic recovery and forensic manager. So again, uh, one of the main reasons people restore from backups today is security breaches. And in that case, using Acronis Cyber Protect is really much better. Now, another thing which is very important is that Acronis Cyber Protect is built for integration. It's our first open product. And so you can integrate with a third party security products. And yes, we have a full blown security engine, which I'm going to talk about on subsequent slides. But uh, if you have something else which you adopt in the company, you can leverage the integration technologies and use that uh, engine, which you use for uh, getting e events into Acronis. We also built in remote management, uh, which is again, extremely useful today because almost everything is remote, especially with remote workers. And we include IT service automation integration features, uh, which again is um, increasingly important even in medium-sized businesses because you are dealing with very large number of workloads. We of course also integrate with uh, many of professional service automation packages for service providers. And again, we always think about productivity of IT pros because uh, again, today every user is no longer one workload, every user um, in the company, every employee is maybe uh, dozens of workloads, which are directly accessed by him, but also maybe indirectly accessed by him or made for him on, on your server infrastructure. Now, there are a number of unique capabilities of uh, uh, Acronis uh, Cyber Protect, uh, which you can only find in our products. So first of all, we have um, a unique ability to, again, integrate with third-party security software. We have a very unique and best-in-class protection against uh, threats for your collaboration applications today. It's Zoom, WebEx, and Teams. We will enhance this list in the future. There are many interesting um, ways how we can in make it safe and secure for you to use those applications and also how to make it more private. For example, we can launch these sessions in the containers. We have an absolutely unique feature, which has been a hit for us in our cloud product since we released it about three months ago. Uh, it's AI-based uh, hard disk failure prediction. So instead of waiting for your hard disk to fail and then restoring it, you will be able to get the pre prediction on with which probability the hard disk will fail. And you will sort of be alarmed when, when the probability is too high. And so there's short time and, and you know, potentially you can configure automated backup at a certain level. We also have um, uh, unique features in security I'm going to talk about in subsequent slides. We always think about efficiency. Efficiency is very important. The best scans are deep scans. Many of the threats are difficult to find uh, uh, only analyzing real-time events, but the deep scans of your computer are very expensive. And also they do not scan the memory correctly. And so we can run the deep scans in backups uh, in the background. So you can do deep scans not once a week, but uh, and not during the night, but uh, every day. Uh, we can uh, we have fail-safe patch management for reduced downtime, so you can actually uh, not actually have to re, re, uh, to to actually uh, reboot your computer. We have uh, white listing, which is very specialized and based on scanning applications and backups. So it's actually specific to your applications. So it will be able to figure out which applications are actually good for you and, and not going to generate false positives. And we have some unique features like recovery manager and forensic manager, which are useful even when you have standard backup images. 
Now, on that point, I wanted to talk about Acronis um, Cyber Protect Security. We're releasing it for the first time, and there are a number of things which I wanted to, to tell about it. And this is really the first time I'm presenting this <coughs> to any kind of public audience. So uh, for the first thing, it's a, um, it's a complete integrated security. So it includes core anti-malware technology, which includes next generation engine for real time um, and on-demand scans which is pretty standard. We believe that our engine is a most modern engine, and so it can analyze um, the uh, behavior on the most um, um, granular level without, with the least overhead. Artificial intelligence-based static analyzer, uh, like any next generation antivirus, a dynamic behavioral protection. We have cloud reputation analysis for our and um, denialists um, and um, um, then other things. In addition to that, we have advanced based artificial intelligence based security um, for uh, URL filtering, identity protection, script analyzing. Especially for URL filtering, it's very important because if you try to configure URL filtering manually, that would be very difficult. There are about uh, 1.5 billion domains in the world, so there is a lot of URLs for you to figure out plus URLs could be subdomains. It's very easy for criminals to trick static um, URL filtering analyzers. We have uh, a system health prediction, which is of course very unique, but um, you know, again, it doesn't matter why your com computer uh, is breaking and other advanced things. Then very, very good uh, preventive security. We believe our uh, patch management and vulnerability assessment is uh, best in class. And again, it's based on artificial intelligence. And so even though we are just releasing it, we believe we support very, very broad set of software to patch and, and this set will grow very, very quickly. Then of course, we think that it's impossible nowadays to just provide a security which will not require management. And so we included a number of technologies to manage security, including secure remote desktop, CyberFit score, uh, point to site VPN, remote wipe for depreciated devices, and we can manage uh, Windows Defender and other antivirus packages in the future. And of course, very important is full backup integration. It's really one product, one agent. And so a recovery uh, is quite often unfortunate um, consequence of threats. Even in case you use the best of the best of the best of the best of uh, security softwares, there are situations where you need to recover. And in that case, we have it integrated. So I just want to sort of show that there are very few products which integrate the complete uh, uh, all-in-one protection in one product. So starting from vulnerability assessment and patch management, going to URL filtering, exploit prevention, cloud reputation analysis, then Alta malware engine scan, so an AI-based static analyzer, then data protection heuristics, and, um, and then behavioral protection. And, and uh, then it's important to remember about fileless threats. Um, now, uh, what is important about uh, security is to, uh, on one side, not to break privacy of your customers, but on the other side is not to create um, uh, too much of the overhead. And really, with Acronis, we are uniquely positioned because we have huge amount of expertise in low level IO, and that gives a huge advantage in heuristics. We can actually analyze a lot of events on, on, on a block level, on a subfile level. And, and so there is a lot of different things which we can do, uh, which are uh, impossible to do or extremely expensive from the performance of your computer with our technology. So, you know, th that's just, uh, one thing which is important that we really have the only solution which covers the whole attack chain end to end. So we have active protection. So we actually believe that competition uh, uh, losing data or, or taking time for the manual recovery of affected files, where in our case, if we determine that there is some uh, been broken or being broken, we can immediately recover and we don't have any limitation on the size of files or number of files or amount of storage we can recover because we are integrated with backup. Then we can protect isolated environments. Um, and, and again, that is important that um, uh, in, um, uh, in the light agents of, of our competition, you can do it only in the situation where uh, you have connection to the cloud uh, and it's fast enough 
and and um, or um, uh, you can do it with some delay, which may be impossible to actually um, uh, to tolerate. Then we have automated disaster recovery and failure, which is again extremely important um, uh, because um, the as we will learn in subsequent slides, no matter what you do about security, no matter how sophisticated you are, from time to time you need to be able to recover. And recovery, even the fastest recovery at fails time. So the best way is to be able to automatically uh, disaster recovery and failover while you are figuring out what happens. And we have integrated vulnerability assessment and immediate um, um, aware patch management. So we have patch management, which can um, we see aware what is happening with the backup and, and with the backup, in the backup and with the backup, and vulnerability assessment, which is analyzing what happened with your system. And, and then all of that, if something happened, can actually, um, um, can actually um, uh, fix the whole um, a system. And again, most of our competitor solutions do not have integrated patch management. And uh, most of them only cover Microsoft applications. And the reality is that most of the time, Microsoft applications is not what is a problem. The reality is that Microsoft um, is, is a well-run company. And so what you need to worry about, about variety of other applications, which I'm sure you run on your computer. And again, we are the only solution which can use information and backups which allows us to keep forensic data in the backup. You can switch on forensic zone with a chronic cyber protect, forensic uh, mode with a chronic cyber protect. And, and with forensic mode, you can keep required information from memory in the backup. And when something happened, you can later immediately have enough information to figure out what happened. Uh, forensic is a major, major problem today because most of the time, cyber criminals are no longer doing things quickly. Most of the time, cyber criminals are um, uh, actually um, getting into your system, doing different, different things, waiting, setting up different hooks, and at some point launching the attack. Well, you might stop the attack or you might actually uh, need to recover, but after you recover, how do you know they're not still in the system? Unless you did your forensic, you cannot be sure of that. Now, um, now, the importance in our future view is that we have to have a self-healing endpoint. The point is that we want to have an endpoint which can, A, be trying to prevent by itself what is happening with it based on the information which is specific to this endpoint. Then um, if, if, if something is happening, it can detect. And again, detection needs to be specific to the endpoint. And then it can respond, and it can respond in a variety of ways. For example, in one way, it can stop the attack or possible attack. In, in another situation, it can watch it and switch on continuous data protection, nothing gets lost. Then if attack actually happened, then uh, the endpoint should be able to uh, uh, recover. Um, and if necessary, it can use disaster recovery feature and immediately launch itself in some uh, local partner or cloud location. And, and then after all of this happened, uh, it needs to actually have ability to figure out what happened and to do forensic. All of this needs to be happening automatically. Unless it happens automatically, you cannot really deal with number of devices. And you will either have uh, not fully functional devices with limited capabilities, or you will have uh, uh, non-protected devices, which will result in limited capabilities after that. So here is just uh, two examples. So one example is example of wasted locker ransomware. We believe Garmin paid around $10 million uh, to wasted locker. And uh, we wanted to just say that Acronis successfully prevents um, the wasted locker on multiple levels. So first of all, we would have uh, stopped it on anti-malware engine scan. Um, and, and so wasted locker attack wouldn't have just penetrated the machines with Acronis cyber protect. Now, even in case, the wasted locker attack would have been modified to the extent that anti-malware engine scan wouldn't have the heuristic or the signature for it. We have AI-based static analyzer, which would have stopped it on that level. And, and so it will not really um, uh, actually be able to do what it needs to do. And then finally, um, we have a behavioral protection, which uh, will look at the behavior of the machine and you know, wasted locker would have perhaps encrypted some files, but we would have actually then 
uh, stopped it after some uh, broken files and we will automatically roll back and no data would have lost. Well, now it's important that, of course, one thing is Garmin paid the money to, uh, to, to the bad guys, but it was also down for 10 days and Garmin makes, uh, um, you know, amazingly important equipment and Garmin is a very respected company and, and it would have been expected to have the best tools for it. Um, would it have used Acronis? Uh, this attack wouldn't have happened and recovery wouldn't have taken 10 days, but it would have taken 10 seconds or I don't know, at maximum 10 minutes. Another example is uh, uh, Maze ransomware. Uh, and this is example on nine machines in Xerox. Uh, two of them were not patched sufficiently. And so with Acronis Simon Protect, uh, 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 all nine machines would have recovered uh, immediately. And, and these two machines would have uh, restored from uh, the cloud within one hour due to CDP. And so back to business in one hour. So detection time is zero hours and total loss maybe $100 because you have two machines for uh, one hour down because you have to restore from the cloud. Now imagine you will use Acronis, crowd, uh, Acronis Backup um, with switched off security features and Acronis and, and CrowdStrike as a protection. So ransomware would not have been detected. This ransomware is not detected by CrowdStrike. All the 11 machines will be locked out. You will have about eight hours of data lost because there is no active protection, there's no CDP, and you typically, you know, you typically have um, a backup once a day. And then you will take about three hours for a full recovery of the machines. Uh, not the recovery required um, on the encrypted files. And, and that is about 33 hours of downtime and 88 hours of recovery time. And so we believe that is about $6,000. Um, uh, and by the way, for um, the uh, CrowdStrike, no detection uh, is still, was still available uh, after 25 days. Now, if you want to use WebRoot, um, and, which is a relative standard antivirus solution, and the backup, uh, you would have much worse situation. You have a ransomware not detected. It's just not detected with WebRoot. All 11 machines would be locked out. And then uh, backups would be deleted because that's the way this ransomware works. There is no self-protection. It's relatively standard for a bad guy when he comes in to first kill security guard. And in this particular case, security guard has no weapons because he's not really a security guard. He's a safety guard. So then, uh, I'm talking about Veeam, and then no data recovery would be possible, so you'll have to pay ransomware, and we believe the total loss will be about $200,000. And so that is the difference between an integrated safety, accessibility, privacy, authenticity, and security, uh, prevention, detection, response, recovery, and forensic, and um, multiple solutions, multiple solutions can never be as effective. And so with that, I just want to point out uh, that today we already have um, a very, very good solution. We're comparing here with Semantic and WebRoad. So um, we also have very aggressive roadmap. If we talk about our classic product, by the end of this year or by the beginning of next year, we not only have the current features, but also have full email security. We also have firewall as a part of the uh, uh, as a part of the uh, Chronic Cyber Protect, we will manage Windows Firewall yeah, domain policy and also add our uh, AI features here. We will launch data loss prevention as a part of the product, uh, probably best in class. We will have a, in, in endpoint detection and response. We also have unique features such as uh, zero trust assessment and management, cyber protection recovery manager, cyber protection forensic manager. Anybody who buys a product today because it's a subscription product will get all these features automatically. Again, it is important that we do not believe in multiple solutions. Many of our competitors have all these features, but these are multiple different products. You have to pay for them separately. They are updated separately. They are not really fully aware of each other. You have to manage them separately, which results A, in higher cost, B, in higher complexity, but most importantly, at the end of the day, it requires a lower protection level. In our case, you get a single product, single UI, single policy, single technology, single price. And even though our product is very, very new, we're just releasing it now, imagine that, we already have all these um, uh, tests. You are very happy to visit these um, well-known websites and see 
the results of the tests. And we also have this uh, certifications here. So uh, there, are, uh, uh, there are 12 uh, tests and uh, six certifications. And, and uh, our goal is to be always in top three in all tests and certifications, in most cases, um, number one. And our goal is to basically pursue every test and every certification. We believe it will be real easy for us because we combine the best of all, both worlds. We combine the future generation technology, new generation technology, and all technology and security. We combine safety with backup, accessibility with disaster recovery, privacy management, authenticity management with notary and security in one package. And, and so it would be really easy for us uh, to be good in this test. One other thing I want to talk to you about is Acronis Cyber Fit Everything Initiative. Um, we believe that it's important for us to uh, help our customers, partners, countries, and to uh, test the, we launch Cyber Fit Score, which will show the level of protection of your workload, Cyber Fit Score for a customer level of protection of the customer infrastructure. Uh, which is, of course, a set of workloads. Protecting set of workloads is always harder than protecting a single workload. And again, it's not only about the hardware and software, but it's also about the network and it's also about the people. Uh, also, we uh, highly encourage our partners to pursue CyberFeed Partner Program, which is about uh, preparing our partners to uh, offer cyber protection. Cyber protection is way broader and way more lucrative, but also requiring better training um, and better certification. And so we have cyber fit levels for partners and we want to cyber fit our partners to the highest level. We also believe that um, cyber protection is a basic um, right for every person and every business. And so we have to make it available in countries. And it's not just about um, localization, but it's also about presence of our data center. It's also about presence of uh, cyber fit partners. It's also about presence of our training certification. And we're gonna invest heavily in promoting this idea of cyber fit with our partnership with leading sport teams, companies like uh, Williams uh, Formula One Racing, Neo Formula E team, Manchester City and Liverpool and Arsenal soccer clubs and sport passer racing. Uh, with that, I just uh, want to say thank you. Apologies for the hiccups. This is the first time I'm showing this presentation. I'm sure I'm gonna get better when I show it 100 times as I did with the previous one. And uh, what do you do now? So first of all, uh, you can go to Acronis website, go acronis.com slash score. That's where you can get for free automatically uh, the, uh, the automatic tool to assess the cyber fit level of your workload. You can see if your workload is cyber fit. Um, if your workload is not cyber fit to good enough level, that just means you are only waiting when you will have a problem with this workload. Second, I encourage you to download the product, install it, test it in your devices. Uh, we, of course, as usual, have a free trial for our product. And the product is really the same product as Acronis Cyber Backup. It's the same product with just different features enabled. So it's the same agent. So it's in some ways a new product, but in some ways it's just a super set of Cyber Backup. So if you run Acronis Cyber Backup, it is especially easy for you to try Acronis Cyber Protect. Then if you're a classic partner, uh, if you are our reseller, um, you can uh, go to Acronis uh, CyberFit uh, Academy and Acronis um, website to see the demo of the product and get trained Acronis Cyber, uh, Cyber Protect capabilities. We have uh, short trainings and medium-sized trainings. They are very uh, modern and very nicely done. It's really easy to get trained. Then I encourage you to protect everybody again. There are many threats which are happening every day to your computers, to your uh, mailboxes, to your applications, which can only be prevented with a chronic cyber protect due to its integrated nature, due to the fact that we can, we have the best protection against ransomware. Every day when I open the news, I find some new threats uh, which hit very well-known companies which if they were to use a chronic cyber protect, they wouldn't have any problem. And another thing which I want to say to all of our uh, classic uh, partners, all of our resellers who sell our, our on-premise product is I highly encourage you to consider becoming a managed service provider with a chronic cyber protect and a chronic cyber fit academy. 
we not only teach you how to sell Acronis Cyber Protect and protect your customers, but also how to be in the business of MSP. I, I think MSP is a future. I think every classic reseller can and must become an MSP to sustain its business, to build a recurring revenue stream, to grow the profit margin, to grow profit, to provide better service for its customers. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sergey, for uh, that insightful and forward-looking presentation. Really appreciate your time. I know you have uh, a big day today, so we'll let you go. And uh, thank you for your insights. We'll move on to the second keynote, which will be presented by Frank Dickinson. Frank joins us uh, as an industry expert from IDC. He's program vice president um, for security and digital trust at IDC. He covers a team that manages everything from network security to endpoint security, cybersecurity analytics, intelligence response, and orchestration. Uh, Frank's own research is focused really on endpoint security, identity, identity and access management, threat analytics, and protection of architectures and business models that are undergoing digital transformation. Frank, at this point, I'll pass it over to you for your keynote presentation. Take it away. Fantastic. Hey, hey thanks a lot. Hey, uh, I do know that I wasn't the guy that was originally supposed to be here. My, my expert on data security, Robin Westerbelt, was going to be here. Uh, she's unexpectedly out of the office, but uh, I'm more than happy to jump in, right? Because this, this is a theme I, I tend to talk about a lot, right? Because if we think about what we're doing moving forward, if we can go to the next slide, right? There's very much this theme going on uh, within all of IT, and this is rethinking. And so as we were going through our, our Futurescape uh, discussions, which is basically we prognosticate what we think is going to happen in the future. We put together, you know, all these prognostications at, at IDC as we're talking about security, right? You'll see one of these on, on, on the board and it's like, you know, by 2022 budgets for modern defined, you know, secure access solutions, such as software defined perimeter will quadruple as companies rethink their approaches to remote access as flaws in legacy VPN remote access centric solutions are illuminated by the massive work from home migrations. And as I presented this, my peers in, in, in other technologies and other groups such as cloud, such as work at home, such as uh, uh, compliance, there was this constant theme. Everybody's having this constant concept called rethink. So if we think about this, this concept of rethinking, if we can move forward to the next slide, you know, this rethinking premise extends to security, right? Work at home migrations and COVID, it didn't really do anything different. It caused us to go, whoa, and step back and rethink. And instead of like that uh, incremental process to addressing security, what it did was make us realize, hey, our environment has changed and maybe the way we were doing things wasn't the right way to do it. Right, because if you think about complexity, if we go to, uh, go to the next slide, security by default is a complex beast, right? And if we think about it, you know, here are the five key drivers, right? We talk about the sophistication of cyber, uh, cyber miscreants growing, right? And it's only getting stronger and more complex and smarter. Sergey went into some really great examples of you know, some of the tricks that Ransom Wells pulls, right? And as we look to defend against you know, that malware, we're seeing this proliferation of security tool sets, right? Let's throw more technology at the problem. And of course, as we're throwing more technology at the problem, the environment's changing, right? So different devices, phones, tablets, computers, right? On-prem, in the crowd, hybrid cloud, right? It's going everywhere, which kind of results in this, what we call the death of perimeter. No longer is our, our people and data and applications all on-prem. Right? We've got people outside the prem, people inside the prem, data outside the prem, applications outside the prem, right? So this, the perimeter has died and we've got this continued growth of compliance regulations, right? And it's not like we can think about security just in a vacuum, right? Because we don't control the world, right? If we think about the way that we uh, look at the environment, if we go to the next slide, right? Really what's going on is security is the tail. And what's wagging the tail is the dog, and that dog is digital transformation, right? How we are injecting technology into our processes to increase 
our, our ability to deliver empathy at scale to our customers, right? To decrease costs, to improve our agility, right? And as we look at this, this hyper connectivity driven by, by this digital transformation, I think she really doubled down on this. And if we want to look at some of the ways that we're describing uh, this digital transformation, if we can go to the next slide, right? I see in, in 2019 outlined these agendas for this digital transformation. And as we look at, you know, this digital transformation goes in many different themes, right? Delivering empathy at scale, delivering trust, delivering connectivity, ensuring experiences, right? And this isn't just anal speak. Right, we actually went and verified this. So at the beginning of the year, what we did was survey our, our end users. Um, if we can go to the next slide, and we said, hey, CEOs, do these agenda items link to where you're going? And you'll see the vast majority of, of CEOs validate that Yes, they have initiatives associated with trust. Yes, they have initiatives associated with, with the, how work is changing. Yes, they have initiatives associated with how connectivity is changing, right? And all of these critical items are, are what's creating this environment as, as uh, Sergey talked about complexity, right? And remember our fundamental component there, our fundamental premise is complexity is the enemy of security. Now, as we think about uh, the way that, that, that these agendas are changing, if we could go to the next slide, right? I'm reminded of a guy by the name of Rube Goldberg, right? And so what Rube Goldberg was, it was he was a, he was a cartoonist, uh, he, he was a sculptor, he was an engineer, but he really had these creative uh, cartoons about connecting dissimilar systems that weren't necessarily meant to be created, connected, Right to create some sort of create some or uh, address some sort of remedial task in this in this cartoon right we we show the the self operating napkin right of all of these systems that are now connected uh, to create this this self operating napkin now if we think about this cartoonist right yes it's funny less yes it's it's somewhat satirical but if we go to the next slide. We'll note that, huh, that's digital transformation, right? What we're doing is connecting operations and HR and sales in these interconnected systems by which the things that weren't previously meant to be connected are now connected. And those connections aren't exactly perfect, right? Because all of these connections are essentially done with an API. And if one half of that API breaks, both halves break, right? And if we have cascading uh, APIs, when one breaks, we can bring down the whole system. So this, I, this idea of digital transformation increases our complexity. Now, when we look at digital transformation uh, as in, in talking uh, about how it relates to COVID, if we go to the next slide, uh, right? We talk about digital transformation, it's humor and reality. The quote of the Microsoft CEO is, hey, we've done two years of digital transformation in two months, right? And this is very much the reality, right? The COVID has now taken and thrown gasoline on this fire of digital transformation. But digital transformation isn't just about taking the existing uh, timeline and making it go faster. COVID has fundamentally caused us to rethink the way that we're approaching this, right? Because in times of crisis, we rethink what we're doing. So at the beginning of the year, in January, we, we surveyed all our, our CEOs. We said, hey, what's more important to you, right? Digital trust programs, digital infrastructure, you know, workplace transformation, those are really big, right? And all of a sudden, we get to a time of crisis and we go, whoa, 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 whoa. Those move down to the bottom. So what's changed? Well, the new things are about resilient operations, about customer experience programs, right? When you get into a time of crisis, what do you worry about? Let's make sure we can deliver offerings. Let's make sure that our customers are happy. Data, 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 right? Because as we talked about this digital transformation loop, the fuel of digital transformation is all about data. And then of course, connectivity, right? So this, 
this COVID isn't just about accelerating digital transformation. It causes us to rethink, right? Everything that we're doing, rethink this whole approach to the complexity, the complexity that Sergey talked about in, in, in the initial keynote. Now, the other thing is we look about these reminders, right? If we go to the next slide, right? COVID all of a sudden forced us to rethink our threats, right? When Sergey was talking about ransomware, maybe we were a little bit passe before COVID. After COVID, we go, oh my gosh, what are our threat vectors? How am I now with everybody at home, right? What am I, what am I vulnerable to? Right. And this was a very interesting study. So we 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 launched this study uh, on March 23rd before the COVID thing hit. Right. And I thought like, oh, my gosh, my results are going to be totally trashed. Exact opposite. Right. Half of the results for this study came before COVID hit the fan. Half of these studies hit after. And it really forced us to start rethinking what's important, rethinking our priorities. Right. All of a sudden we go. Oh, ransomware is important, right? After COVID hit, we go, oh my gosh, right? I am very vulnerable to ransomware. I am very vulnerable to phishing. I am very vulnerable to business email compromise. The front lines of our, of our businesses against this cyber miscreant, we're reminded that they've changed, right? We were reminded that we are no longer on prem. Now, we think, hey, everything's going to go back to normal. But if we think about the reality, if we go to the next slide, the reality is different, right? When we ask people, you know, about working from home, you know, about 6% uh, of people were remote before COVID. After COVID, we're now looking at, you know, like 53% are remote. And oh, by the way, in 2021, we asked people, hey, is everybody gonna come back to the office? The answer is no, it's not gonna go back to the way it was. Things are fundamentally different. The complexity that you're looking at, the complexity that we're telling you you need to rethink is not going to change. So if we go to the next slide, there's a couple of you know, key themes that we want to hit you know, about this expanding attack surface, right? In this new reality, and maybe it's not a new reality, but it's 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 that we realize that our reality is fundamentally changed. Right, we're noticing that there's a whole lot of things different. You know, companies are deploying more mobile devices. You know, companies are now encouraging work from home. Uh, companies are now employing you know more agile IT. These are not things that are new. They are things that a we realize now that oh my gosh we have this complexity and it's accelerating. So those of you who are on the other end watching this, right, you're dealing with this complexity. And you need to be rethinking the way that you fundamentally approach security and IT to deal with this complexity. And it's important to note, this problem isn't something that you can just solve with more bodies, right? Because if we go to the next slide, one of the themes that we've been talking about for a long time are the skill shortages, right? You know, as we look, there will be 10 and a half million additional full-time equivalent employees needed over the next five-year period, almost 10% of those are in security, right? You just can't go, hey, I have a security problem and I'm going to throw bodies at the problem. And oh, by the way, COVID didn't help that. If we go to the next slide, you'll see that as we ask people what skills you needed to help, you know, deal with this 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 talent issue after the first wave of the economic recovery after COVID, right? Cybersecurity still remains one, but you're you're noticing some themes there, right? You know, IT operations, digital innovation, right? Companies are now needing to respond, and you're seeing some other themes come in. It's more than just security; it's about product reliability. It's about technology innovations. Companies are recognizing that they fundamentally need to do things differently. Now. If you go to the next slide, this is one of my favorite slides, right? And this is uh, a gentleman by the name of Theodore Levitt. Uh, he was the editor of the Harvard Business Review, right? And he said something I think is profound, right? He said, people don't want a quarter inch drip. They want a quarter inch hole, 
right? And as we in security tend to focus on the problem, we tend to focus on the wrong problem. We tend to focus on, hey, you know, we we need another endpoint security, or we need we need EDR tools, or we need more SIM. We tend to focus on product, 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 product. The problem's not a product problem. You know, as we talk about rethinking our approach to security, it's not a product problem. It's it's a security problem. So as we rethink it, it's not about throwing more tech at the issue. It's about addressing the fundamental problem. Now, as, as we look at dealing with the fundamental problem, the fundamental problem is complex. If we go to the next slide, right, we have this, we have this no, numerous numbers uh, of complexity, right? We have high-risk data channels like internet access points, lost or stolen smartphones, employee remote access, Wi-Fi sniffing of endpoints, email leakage, right? The number of channels is high, right? If we look at da high-risk data types, you know, secrets, encryption keys, passwords, credit card data, personally identifiable information, right? Data is the heart of this digital transformation. Now, as we look at the next slide, right, here are the benefits, they're the key themes. The, this is the problem. This is how we define it. So as you start to rethink your approach to security, rethink it based upon this. So are the problems that we're dealing with, malware, right, business email compromise, uh, other sorts of issues. Now, as we do that, we articulate the problem you know, we had a really interesting survey, right? And so we, as we were talking to people about their endpoint vendor of choice, we said, hey, how many of you have switched? And of those people that switched, we go, hmm, let's look at this data. So as you're rethinking your endpoint approach, what was the number one reason you would switch? And if we go to the next slide, the number one reason that people switched were to reduce the number of endpoint agents, right? As we rethink this approach to IT, right? As we rethink this approach to security, there's a number of quote unquote soft costs that ain't so soft, right? And you see that in this data as why people are switching vendors, right? Reducing the number of agents, reducing incident investigation time, improving prevention of zero day attacks, right? reducing the spread of malware, reducing the number of vendors, right? There's a ton of soft costs that if you get more strategic, if you rethink your approach, if you don't do what you do yesterday because yesterday is no longer the reality, right? You can take the approach to be able to strategically do things better. Consolidation of uh, agents, re reduction of complexity. And as you reduce the complexity that sometimes is self-created, you create the ability to be able to deliver a higher level of security. So I, I've talked a lot about COVID. What does COVID mean moving forward? Well, there's a host of things, but here's the thing that I would tell you. Look at rethinking for the next normal, right? You know, don't rethink your approach to security Rethink your approach to IT overall, because the more that we can integrate security into our IT, the more that we can in fact harden our infrastructure, the more that we can reduce complexity, the better off we are. Let's, let's prevent the problem, let's simplify, let's reduce complexity, that will make our ability to implement security better, right? I always encourage people, focus on, on the four new control points, endpoint, identity, application, data. That is how you need to frame security moving forward. And of course, the last thing I would recommend is uh, strongly look at retiring legacy IT approaches. They were born in an era that wasn't the reality of digital transformation. Digital transformation is fundamentally required a rethinking of our approach to security. And with that, hey, I just want to say thank you for the time. I realize that uh, that there's other things you could be doing. I'm thrilled that you took the time to listen to me and AI thank you, Cronus, for the opportunity to speak. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Frank. Very insightful. I thought the, uh, the slide with who's driving digital transformation, your CEO, your CTO, nope, throw that all in the trash. The pandemic uh, changes the whole script and, and decides what, you, what drives change. So 
Very interesting presentation, a lot of good data points there. We will pivot now into our first panel session. I'm gonna introduce our moderator for that session. That is the Reverend James R. Slaby. He will be driving the discussion about better security, higher automation, and lower costs, new solutions that deliver on all three. Uh, James is a colleague of mine for a number of years, longtime product marketing pro and former industry analyst. Uh, covering specifically cybersecurity. So with that, James, I'll kick it over to you. Thanks so much, Pat. Uh, thanks again to Sergey and Frank uh, for uh, that really interesting and I thought uh, really kind of mutually supporting uh, kind of uh, perspectives. Uh, to kind of continue on that theme, I've got three really uh, terrific uh, panelists uh, uh, to talk about uh, the kind of cybersecurity issues that uh, have been raised by some of Sergey's and Frank's discussions here. So let me start uh, with uh, introducing Brian Shield. Uh, he's the VP of IT for the Boston Red Sox, has been so for seven years. That's thrilling to me as a lifelong Sox fan who lives in downtown Boston and is uh, really suffering in the, the lack of the ability to go to Fenway Park this year. Uh, but Brian's responsible for technology for the club and for Fenway sports management where he leads all phases of tech strategy from creating a compelling fan experience at Fenway Park to enabling an effective front office and baseball operations environment. Our panel uh, also includes Andres Armeda, uh, better known as Dre. Uh, I really wish I had a cool hip hop nickname like that. Uh, but he is the uh, co-founder and founding CEO at Sucuri, uh, a website security SaaS company that GoDaddy acquired in 2017. Uh, from that, at that point, Dre uh, led product management for GoDaddy Security Product Group. Uh, today, he's the Senior Director of Technical Program Management and so leads global program management at GoDaddy, including its project management office and its total project management effort for its partner's business. Uh, our third esteemed panelist is the notorious Candid West. Uh, he's a Cronus's Vice President for Cyber Protection Research and his job is to research new threats and uh, comprehensive data protection methods. Uh, before we managed to poach him, uh, he spent more than 16 years as the tech lead for Semantics Global Security Response Team. Uh, he's a widely published author. Uh, he's a media favorite on security topics. He's a frequent speaker at uh, big time conferences like RSA and Area 41. He also serves uh, as the advisor to the Swiss federal government on cyber risks. Uh, pretty cool job. Um, with that, I want to uh, uh, say thanks to the panel and let's go to, um, here I'm, uh, I'm driving as well as moderating here, so uh, give me one second. Uh, there we go. You. All right, guys. Um, so question number one that I've got, I'm going to take you through a series of these questions is about the source of breaches these days. The, the stat that I picked for this one is that 46% of all malware delivered to businesses uh, it, it comes in via email. It's from Verizon's most recent report. So my question is, how have, uh, given that uh, this kind of perimeter model that uh, Frank talked about before is really kind of faded and that we're now thinking about putting data at the center of things. How is your cybersecurity strategy evolving and uh, how do you see it evolving in the kind of the wider world uh, to respond to this kind of shift that the, the, you know, it's really no longer about building a fortress, but we really got to focus our protection efforts on data. Dre, uh, why don't you start with that one? Well, uh, uh, thank you. I appreciate the introduction and, and it's a really interesting question. I have a probably slightly different perspective than the rest of the gentlemen here being that I've, I've been focused on the web solely for a good you know, decade plus uh, and the end user in those environments. So it, it's, it's interesting to see that because there has been a sheer focus in that area around um, a, a narrative that's saying that S, uh, SSL and encryption is security and that you are in a very good state if your stuff's encrypted. And that's driven large in part by, by, the, uh, by the browsers and, and the web landscape to really push SSL is something that's, that's necessary, but we've got to think of it more comprehensively. Um, I think that it's, it really comes to a, a comprehensive suite of security tools to make sure that you're, you're really impacting what those security um, uh, vectors are 
that, that are predominant, at least in our environment on the web. So really encryption is one piece of that. We got to concentrate on protection. Let's stop those threats before they get into the environment. Um, and specifically in the web, uh, we want to think about that at the edge before it gets in and infiltrates those servers, that environment, those end, um, uh, endpoint uh, web applications. Performance is a big deal there, right? Because if it's not if it's not performing, it's really not working. We're not we're limiting the actual passive traffic, and that is a big part of security there. Uh, monitoring uh, internally and externally, we've got to make sure that we're understanding what type of attack uh, points we might be dealing with within the environment, and also those that are, are being uh, portrayed outbound, right? So let's say SEO spam, things like that, that might be uh, showing in Google results and so on. We want to make sure that we're monitoring those things to understand what's been attacked so we can go in and remediate, which is a big part of that. And often, and one of the biggest weak points that we see, at least in, in our uh, audience, is disaster recovery. Making sure that you have a solid plan of attack to make sure that uh, you're able to reduce the amount of downtime when there is some type of catastrophic event with the environment. Um, you know, in terms of leading attack vectors that we're seeing alongside email being, uh, you know, phishing attacks and th those types of social engineering uh, events that happen quite frequently, whether that's a small mom and pop business or a large um, uh, organization is SEO spam, which is compromising something like 62% of websites out there today in terms of the cleanup that we see in remediation. There is a big impact of those types of automated uh, attacks that are happening in, in uh, environments small and large. Uh, on the web today, and and you do see multiple attack vectors working working together to to do so. Thanks for that, Dre. Uh, Candid, can you uh, offer a brief comment uh, from your perspective uh, as uh, uh, as a big wig at Acronis on cybersecurity issues? Yeah, sure. I mean, as you said, we're kind of in new territory, right? So we live in the work from anywhere world now, and the pyramid is gone, and it's kind of the user identity is the new parameter. So I think the important thing is to always know where your data is, right? And what's happening with it. Is it shared with collaboration tools? Is it encrypted? Who has access to it? Is there a backup? Uh, is there maybe a copy and everything? So knowing is the first thing. And then of course, applying policies to it so that you know nothing bad will happen to it. All right, that's great stuff, guys. Let's move on to the next uh, question here. Uh, obviously, we live in a world where the threat environment has gotten a lot more sophisticated. Uh, cyber criminals operate more like a, a kind of a large scale SaaS operation. You know, my stat here is that basically any idiot with a browser and an internet connection can get a free kit on the dark web and get themselves into the ransomware distribution business, which is, you know, certainly why we think it's one of the most pervasive threats out there. It's just a damn profitable uh, business model and it scales really beautifully. To say nothing of, you know, state actors getting into the game, not just for geopolitical purposes, but to make money, um, uh, steal intellectual property and so forth. So uh, my question to the panel here is, how do you respond to the fact that uh, the threats are just a lot more complicated and uh, have scaled up at a much greater level uh, than they did just a few years ago. Brian, now why don't you start here? Sure. Yeah, you know, I think Sergey said this really well, and, and I think you reiterated it too, is that, you know, the sad part is, is that there are a lot of tools out there that, you know, you don't have to be an expert anymore to be a cybersecurity criminal in some respects, you know, and be able to kind of exploit known vulnerabilities and create malware and things like that. So, so I think it's incumbent upon us, obviously, to kind of respond accordingly. In, in Major League Baseball, we've been fortunate in that we've had a, a very sophisticated and um, thoughtful program that it really kind of addresses, you know, Canvas is really some 30 clubs, you know, with some of the best in breed um, cybersecurity programs and tools, you know, to kind of, you know, try to keep pace with this environment. I think more and more we look for sort of moving from defense to offense, um, kind of where we can. Um, the power of AI, um, as we heard Sergey mentioned, I think is, is going to become increasingly important. Um, you know, no human can really kind of keep pace with the, the breadth of how things are changing as quickly as they are. But I, but I also think, you know, Frank made another really good point relative to all this is that while complexity is increasing and scales increasing, you know, one of the defenses to that in, on your end can be simplification, like don't get, you know, too broad with the tools. Don't, we know there's a, we know there's a resource gap here. And so I think part of it is, is sort of 
find kind of, you know, your areas of most, you know, deepest vulnerabilities and try to look for tools like, like in our case, we obviously leverage um, Corona's quite effectively, you know, to kind of simplify single panes, less complexity, fewer UIs, you know, things like that. So we can kind of respond in a more efficient manner. Cool, cool stuff. Uh, Dre, can you uh, uh, add a brief comment on that question, please? Again, from the end user perspective, it's really challenging to help them understand how, how impactful this could be. Um, you, you know, oftentimes they, you, you talk to customers and they go, why would they attack my cupcake website, right? There's no value to folks. <laughs> but again, it comes back to those automated opportunistic attacks. So helping them understand what those risks are and the impacts to their business, their ideas, the, the ventures that they've got going on is super important. So I think that education piece certainly like Brian mentioned through, through simplification um, helps them understand how they might be affected by this and how they can reduce the risk for themselves. All right. Thanks for that guys. Let's move on uh, to the next one. You know, we're going to have a second panel in a little bit uh, from folks from the manufacturing industry where automation is really key. Uh, and you look at uh, the amount of money that's being poured into uh, investment in, uh, AI on the tech side. Uh, and so the question is, this This is a theme that both uh, Frank and Sergey talked about, that uh, if you're going to improve efficiency, you really need to enlist uh, smart machines basically on your behalf. Uh, if you're ever going to kind of keep up, uh, coordinate, orchestrate uh, with the volume and the sophistication of the threats that we face. So my question is, uh, what are you all doing in terms of actually deploying machine learning, AI, other kinds of automation uh, as part of your armament to kind of keep up in this uh, escalating war. Uh, Ken, did you want to uh, 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 offer some uh, brief insight from what you're seeing out there? Sure. And of course, from a uh, vendor perspective or research perspective there, um, it's fortunate that we're not yet um, facing this digital cyber terminator, which on its own decided that he wants to attack you, right? Because that will definitely be a bad thing to happen. But we do see that the attackers are using kind of automation wherever possible. So they are using artificial intelligence to, for example, dynamically generate phishing emails. They use game theory to check which one was actually more successful, so who clicked on it. So it's just a matter of time, right? They will automate it, and so have you. So as a defender, you need to make use of the help of AI, machine learning, to automate it wherever possible. Because Sergey mentioned it, right? Every day we see about 300,000 new malware samples being created automatically somewhere. So if you want to face that by hand, you're just going to be swamped, right? You have to have an efficient solution. And as Brian said, it has to be simple, right? Just adding uh, kind of layers and layers and layers. That's, I mean, yes, multi-layer is good, but each layer adds complexity as well. So it has to be simple in order to work and in the end, you actually sh should not really deal with it, right? You should have the self-healing infrastructure or self-healing endpoint, as Sergey mentioned as well, so that it's doing it on its own and you can then focus on probably the more important task as in um, how to get the people back into the stadium. Great stuff. Uh, Dre, you got uh, a, a little bit of an observation on what you might be doing at GoDaddy or what you see uh, coming down the pike there? I mean, from, from a, I could speak from a web application firewall perspective, we do have a, a pretty rich WAF that, um, that, that does uh, certain heuristics and, and different uh, uh, web application profiling. And, and through that, I mean, we blocked something like 250 million attacks over the last like eight months or something through that firewall and unique websites <laughs> across, across the web coming from all sorts of places, right? And, and the, the actual signatures that were created from that often were variations, permutations of over hundreds of thousands of different strings coming into attack, all of them automated, again, opportunistic. There's no way to keep up with that. I mean, a Brian and Candid uh, state. So 
we've employed um, a full research team and have been developing different types of artificial intelligence to help understand and get in front of a lot of those attacks uh, so that we could start to restrict those um, uh, before it starts to spread across the entire network. So we see those very quickly. We're able to get in front of them uh, through, through this AI uh, and of course our awesome research team um, to, to go and spread that out to the entire network as efficiently as possible to block those attacks from hitting the entire network. So um, it works really well to, to scale. Um, and, and without it, we, I mean, always a step behind. So it's certainly helping us curve, curve that, uh, that distance or Delta between how quickly they're able to get these, uh, malicious attacks deployed and where we're able to protect our, our user base. All right. I'm going to move along because, uh, we've got a lot of great content to get through here. Uh, audience, please continue to uh, use the Q and A interface on zoom. If you want to submit questions to the panel, uh, or the subsequent panel that we're going to have later on. Uh, this is a, a question four is a, a problem that I dealt with a lot in my analyst days when I straddled the network and the cybersecurity worlds, which is that very often IT operations and uh, the security staff are, can kind of be at loggerheads, you know, different budgets, different agendas, sometimes different uh, management reporting lines. But it seems pretty obvious uh, given the way that uh, uh, data protection is a function of IT operations and cybersecurity are clearly converging. And I've got to believe that, uh, that, that beyond the tech that there's operational and cultural issues that you need to deal with. Uh, and I, my, my question then to the panel is, uh, are you seeing that in your own environment? And if so, how are you dealing with it? Uh, Brian, why don't you start? Sure. Um, you know, I think this is sort of a good news, bad news the question. The, um, I mean, I mean it, it's a little bit, I think, inherent um, in any environment where there's going to be some element of conflict. You know, I think first and foremost, I think it's really kind of a leadership, I mean, question. You, you know, you brought up a very good point, which is, you know, sometimes the organizational alignments don't always sort of make this as efficient as possible. But part of this is sort of understanding awareness and empathy. Um, but also, I think as organizations are moving to the cloud, one of the inherent good news elements of it is, is if they're doing it in an effective manner, you know, actually transition from like maybe dev to DevOps to DevSecOps type of thing, you know, it almost becomes part of the, the, um, the fabric. Right, you know, you, it, the old days we'd write code, sometimes throw it over the, you know, the cube to some ops people to implement it, and and we'd have some testing processes type of thing. Today, I think most mainstream organizations realize that it's a highly integrated process. With, and, you know, and now with cybersecurity kind of being kind of inherent in that whole blended, you know, model, if you will. So I'm encouraged that I think the um, that it's going to happen a little bit more naturally um, than it has happened kind of in the past with maybe three different groups kind of growing up um, kind of in parallel with one another. Uh, thanks for that. Uh, Dre, um, any uh, observations you want to chip in here? Yeah, often, I mean, we've thrown uh, technology, we've thrown uh, process at things, but we don't think, uh, think about the people. Um, empathy, one being one thing, but really making uh, this more um, the security piece, uh, it's often left as later part of the life cycle where we, I think we need to represent it earlier on as we're developing these relationships around what requirements are, what we need to accomplish from an IT perspective, from a security perspective. And we need to institute security as part of that life cycle. And I think this makes it easier to plan and create a more holistic approach. Um, to our service around IT and security. Frank nailed it earlier. I think we need to rethink that, uh, but I think it's, it extends beyond that. We need to reset and re really re-execute the way that we connect and marry uh, those two requirements um, and then iterate on that, make sure that we continue re reiterating that these are two key important pieces that need to mesh and mold together matrixed. All right, great. I um. I was glad that Brian uh, alluded to uh, DevOps and DevSecOps because uh, that's a nice segue into uh, our final question for the panel before we get to uh, audience Q&A and some other things. Um, uh, not everyone is, I, I think, uh, particularly far down the path of more tightly integrating uh, the application development process with the perspectives of users you know, the, the DevOps approach, uh, that, that's something that it, we've talked about for a lot of years and some organizations are just struggling to get up the path with. And around the corner from that, uh, here comes DevSecOps where you're also trying to integrate security perspectives uh, right from the design get-go as well as thinking about end users. 
uh, obviously that's very consonant with what Acronis is doing. You know, when we, we think about uh, how we are converging data protection with cybersecurity, but I wondered if uh, you could comment on uh, the process as it relates to actually uh, building applications. Um, again, Brian, since you, you uh, first brought it up, why don't you start with this one? Yeah, I, I mean, as we touched on this one just a moment ago, but I, I think what's what's so important here, um, and you know, um, Trace did a nice job of saying this too, which is, it starts at the outset of projects, right? And it also it also focuses on like how do you measure success? I think too often on application, say, development output projects, people measure success by you know, it, does the app meet the needs of the users, which is great. You know, um, and does it have many defects? Uh, now, it's much, much more complicated than that, right? Are these, you know, I think as we think about measuring success, is it sort of, it's the success of the application meeting the needs of the business. It's the success of it running and performing as expected and, and hitting all of our operational KPIs and things. And it's the success of sort of ensuring that there's sort of no vulnerabilities. Those are not easily done if you're doing them sort of, um, you know, kind of in parallel. These are these are kind of, you know, these are, well, sort of, they need to be done in a serial manner in some respects where everyone's sort of integrated from the outset as, um, as Dre said a moment ago. So in my mind, I, I think it's kind of the nice thing is that it's it should be inherent in I think most people's, you know, um, forms of how they do software, their software development life cycles, I think going forward. So I think it'll happen a little bit naturally. And I think tools will evolve to, um, to help ensure that there's a tighter you know, cohesion. But ultimately it comes down to leadership and it comes down to ensuring you've got strong you know, leaders who kind of understand sort of the, uh, the critical importance of the overall project, not just the respective like areas of you know, you know, discrete domains. I think I'm detecting a, a recurring theme there. Yeah, if stakeholders and sponsors are going, oh, crud, now here comes the security stuff. We got to do that. They start thinking it's information, you know, prevention, not protection, right? It's too late in the cycle. Like it hasn't been introduced early enough for us to go, look, this is an inherent part of this. So we understand the risk <laughs> long term to you, your application, your requirements and, and the outcome of this project. Because if we're not doing that up front, it's, it becomes a burden to them. We need to make sure that they're educated and understand uh, how this could impact them long term and, and the benefits of that. Like, how are you measuring success on this project short and long term, the life cycle of that, right? And if we're not thinking about security up front and through the entire life cycle, it could become problematic for them. So a lot of it's education and awareness. Candid, uh, last thoughts before we move on. I think Dre already pointed it out that as early as you can actually fix it or think about the security, then it will actually also be cheaper. If you have to fix it once it's already shipped, it's going to be a lot more expensive. So through the whole life cycle, it has to be a consideration as security is a shared responsibility. All right, gentlemen, uh, we're going to move to one of my favorite parts of uh, these virtual conferences. Uh, your opportunity to give our attendees a practical bit of advice uh, that they can take away with them. Uh, if, uh, if you've been dozing off in the audience here, this is the point to wake up because uh, there's some really uh, pithy uh, uh, advice from some very experienced guys here. Um, so Brian, your tip is cybersecurity isn't just a technology issue, it's an employee issue. Now I obviously boiled that down from what you originally sent me to fit the screen. So could you please uh, give us some additional color on that? Yeah, you know, I noticed that mine and Dre's are, are kind of similar. So I'll say a comment on this one and maybe kind of interweave another one as well, which is, I mean, we, we've, you've heard it here through the whole panel. Um, I think every, everyone that's spoken has made this comment, but you know, at the end of the day, we can, we can create this hardened shell to kind of protect our company, but the, it's only as good as our employees and how we can keep them aware of, of the challenges that face them. So I'm gonna pivot slightly and say, the other one I would sort of add a little bit and that you've also heard quite a bit about is simplification. I don't think it gets enough airtime. You know, this is, it's not about sort of finding the best and breed tool in every little domain of your cybersecurity um, program. It's finding complementary products that sort of allow your people to be as efficient as possible to kind of meet the needs as they exist. And so um, as it pertains to these different things, I think, you know, simplification, awareness, education are, are key to uh, long-term success. Fantastic. Uh, Candid, uh, yours reads a little bit like a Zen Cohen. Uh, I'm sure there's a lot of wisdom hidden in these few words, but you said, in order to be prepared, increase your visibility and start to automate. Um, please uh, elucidate. Yeah, I mean, it goes into the similar direction, right? You need to know what's actually happening 
inside your infrastructure, inside your application, which also means, of course, now inside the cloud applications that you are using, right? Know who's accessing the data and so on. Without those informations, you're blind. You don't really know, does actually someone attack me at the moment? Did someone already steal the information? So you need to have a visibility. And then of course, you should not be manually going through those log files and kind of checking, oh, was this IP address actually from the good guys or the bad guys, right? You need to automate it. And maybe to allude on um, Brian's point there, I was thinking on the kind of human factor as well, but maybe I'm just too kind of pessimistic after 12 or yeah, 20 years of looking at threats out there that I know it has to be a combination of user awareness and technology as there will always be someone who clicks on that email because it was so enticing and they really, really wanted to win in the Spanish lottery. <laughs> so, I mean, you can't really blame them, but of course, yes, if we don't make them aware, then it will be everyone clicking on it. So it has to be the right balance, but it has to be simple. Seems like a reasonable segue into uh, Dre's tip. The hackers' biggest opportunities end users, so educate them repeatedly and empower them to make better decisions. Do tell how, us more about that, How awesome is it that all of us independently created these tips and they're so interwoven? Like, it's, it's ridiculous. Yep. So yep. cool. Um, candid to your point, couldn't agree more. The technology is another big piece of that, but also process. So people processing technology, it is, it is a fine balance. To Brian's point, I mean, simplicity is something that we deal with every day. And in a lot of instances, um, again, end users, but I think this translates across any audience uh, that's, that's working in technology is simplicity is super important because nine times out of 10, they don't really care about security. They want that end state, uh, which I think was talked about a little earlier. Um, they don't want to get hacked. And if they get hacked, they want to make sure that it's cleaned up and they don't want it to happen again. How do we get them to that end state? Well, it's through education in a lot of ways, because we often think about people as the weakest link. I think they're the most uh, maybe unaware in a lot of ways of those impacts. We need to continue that discussion, make sure that we iterate or reiterate that as often as possible um, because that repeated message is what's going to help us reduce that. We get through all the tools we want at the world and process, but if we're not helping them across the finish line using and leveraging those tools the right way, uh, we'll, we'll never get there. So let's focus on the people, empower them to make better decisions. Great stuff, guys. All right. Uh, we've got some great questions coming in from the audience. Uh, let me start with this one. Since layering adds complexity and is not the best long-term solution, what AI-based solution can replace layering to ensure we're not pulling out, we're not pulling our, putting all our eggs in one solution basket that was designed and created by imperfect human beings? Candid, do you want to take a crack at that one? Yeah, so if I understood correctly, it's the kind of single point of failure, right? If you simplify just to have everything in one kind of single solution, then of course there is the chance that if that one fails, your system will be down, right? So that's where you actually need to have um, availability and kind of multiple paths to it. So to make sure, kind of back to the self-healing aspect, right? That if something is not working correctly, that it can automatically detect this. And I'm not just talking about detecting malware threats, but maybe reconfiguring your VPN settings or rolling back some system changes that you made all of this and the technology is there to do this with artificial intelligence, right? There's processes like human in the loop where the system can learn from the experts and then apply and say, hey, the last time or the last 10 times this issue actually occurred, they also just clicked here and here. Let's do it automatically, right? So I think, yes, there is of course the risk of a single point of failure. You should definitely look that that's not gonna happen, but if you have too many different solutions, there's a higher risk that one of them will fail because you misconfigured it. So I think uh, it's still better to simplify. All right, got another question. I'm, I'm certainly echoed by something Frank said before, which was talking about uh, the cybersecurity skills gap. Uh, you know, the stat I often quote when I'm presenting webinars to our partners is that something like three and a half million uh, cybersecurity jobs will go unfilled by the end of next year. Uh, I, uh, uh, how are you dealing, uh, our, our question here is, how are you dealing with that skills gap? Uh, Brian, you wanna chime in there, please? 
Sure. Um, so I think there's a, a multi-phase thing. I, I think, you know, one thing that COVID has probably taught all of us is that um, if your organization relied on resources that were just nearby, uh, you need to rethink that, right? Or you have the opportunity to rethink that. I think there's this reality check we saw in Frank's graph that shows that, you know, companies are starting to wake up to the realities that you can find great talent uh, in a lot of different places. So, you know, there's an expression, you need to kind of fish where the fish are. You know, and I, I think you're going to have to find those fish in certain cases, especially on the on the um, cyber space, because you know they're they're not always going to be equally spread across the globe. So I think that's going to be um, incumbent upon companies. I think you also have to kind of there's some element here around you know training some of your own folks. We've developed a lot of great relationships with colleges and institutions. The good news is is that they are um, very aware that this is a very marketable in demand skill. Uh, we bring them in early and often um, as co-ops and interns to kind of learn, you know, and that type of thing. So in my mind, this is a, um, a quilt that we're building here. This is not a single solution. It's not, I wouldn't um, suggest people just, it, this is just a, a human capital problem. This is a, you need to kind of have a, a very thoughtful, you know, resource strategy to kind of come up with solutions as well as great partners and ensuring that those partners are progressive. You know, it, it's like, it's great to have tools, but are these the right partners who are, you know, proactively kind of, you know, modernizing their tool on a regular basis. All right, we're uh, running a little behind. So I'm gonna go with just one more quick question here. Apologies to the audience if we didn't get to your questions live on the air. We promise we will follow up with you uh, after the event if we didn't get to it. Um, Dre, I think this is a good one for you to answer. Um, uh, how has the pandemic uh, changed your approach to cybersecurity? What, uh, changes have you made since the start of the crisis that you see surviving into the aftermath? Oh, there, there's, there's couldn't, couldn't get through this without one pandemic question. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, actually, some of this actually ties into what, what, uh, uh, Brian in the last question, because it is such a different world today and uh, maybe into, into the future more um, or, or many organizations with cyber cyber skill requirements will kind of start thinking a, a, a little bit differently. We're in a place where we're no longer, you know, restricted or by the perception that we need to hire locally or, or keep people constrained to one area. We have this, this, this um, dispersed uh, way or the, the redistributed way of, of, of being able to apply things. We've lived online in a lot of ways for a long time in the, in the offerings that we give our audience and the pandemic may not have affected us in the same way from a customer perspective, being that we offer digital services, right? Um, meaning we have a lot of tools to our customers that work remote already, or they have digital businesses. There is brick and mortar, but that audience is, is pretty broad. Now, not to say that we haven't changed a lot internally. When you start to think about um, our operations being uh, um, a customer first organization and we have various call centers worldwide and that, that shifted the way that we were able to work. So implementing strong um, policy, again, training and education around how we should be thinking about our workflows and securing those things. Everybody's working from home and I'm talking completely global. Right. That becomes a very interesting uh, model for us over time. And I suspect that that's something in large in part will carry with us and it will change the way that we operate in terms of brick and mortar. That's probably the biggest, biggest impact for us. But it was a very quick transition and we were able to get through that. Um, and that's a testament to our IT staff and, and uh, the, the, the group in care. Uh, that wasn't working from home, being able to, to shift uh, that model very quickly and support our customers very, with very little drop off. In fact, uh, quite a few improvements. Yeah, I hear that one. Uh, Cronus's uh, IT team was incredible. You know, we went overnight from being largely centrally office based to everyone yeah. working from home. And uh, they were, they've been really uh, fantastic through it. All right, uh, Dre, Brian, Candid, I want to thank you guys so much uh, for your time and for your insights. Uh, we hope to see you all again soon. Uh, in the meantime, we got to move along. So I'm going to kick things back to Pat Hurley. Thank you. Thank you very much, guys. Very interesting panel session. There are a lot of good questions and some engagement from uh, our attendees as well. What we've got now for you is a really quick demo. We are launching a new product later this month, the Cronus Cyber Protect 15. I'm going to pass it over for about a five minute demo here with Dan before we come back and wrap up with one final panel session uh, on the topic of manufacturing. So over to you, Dan, for the CyberProtect 15 demo. Okay, thanks team. Hello and welcome everyone. We're gonna take a few minutes here to explain some of the features of CyberProtect and the real world applications of them. 
First of all, for anyone not intimately familiar with the way Acronis provides backup protection, it comes in the form of a plan. A plan is essentially a package of rules that determines what should be backed up and the times and conditions that apply. CyberProtect builds on that and integrates security and controls in the same process using the same look and feel. So here I'm just going to disable the backup plan selection and talk about some of the new and enhanced features. Before I get into them, let me zoom in a little to help illustrate what I'm talking about. So first of all, we can manage the antivirus and anti-malware components. Here you'll find all of the options and settings you'd expect from such a feature. For instance, we can tune how Active Protection deals with threats. If you're not already familiar with Active Protection, it's a feature that monitors for and determines how we deal with malware attacks. Take the scenario where we notice files being encrypted and renamed, possibly as part of a ransomware attack. Do we want to inform someone on the admin team, stop the process from continuing, or automatically roll back the changes using system cache? To guarantee consistency, anti-tamper controls are built in so that malicious software can't stop or suspend the underlying services in an attempt to circumnavigate and perpetuate the attack. There are, of course, configurable options that relate to real-time protection and the configuration of periodic system scans that extend to the protection of removable hardware, very important in this case. URLs can be filtered either based on predefined categories, such as hacking or gambling, or by adding them individually to the list of exclusions. Here, we can add exceptions to the categories in place, or add URLs in isolation to be blocked. Windows components can be managed through the UI as well. Windows Defender and Security Essentials can not only be uh, configured, but also tracked through the CyberProtect console. Having worked in large, fragmented IT departments in the past, I particularly like the vulnerability assessment and the patch management feature. The vulnerability assessment will check each machine where the plan is assigned, ensure the software installed is up to date, and consequently, there are no open doors for malicious software or bad actors. You can choose the scope for assessment and also build conditions into the schedule. For example, ensuring a task is run on startup if it were to miss its original scheduled start for whatever reason. Where there are vulnerabilities found, the patch manager can work to ensure necessary patches are applied and security is maintained. This can be done automatically or as a staged manual process. And we'll see what that looks like in just a second. But also note there is an option to perform a backup prior to applying any patches. The final thing to mention in this section is the data protection map. This is a means to identify any critical file types that may not currently be backed up. The most common use case for this is one a lot of people are currently experiencing with working from home where data is being saved to a common folder, and that folder alone is the one being backed up, purely for the purpose of efficiency. The data protection map will identify any files that fall outside of that working directory and could therefore impact production if it were lost. And to illustrate what it looks like when the plan has uh, executed, we can start with the software management tab. The patches selection will show all of the available patches and their approval status. Notice as well how we can also deploy patches on an ad hoc basis, particularly useful in the case of high priority issues. Additionally, you'll see some new widgets on the dashboard. They tell the story of security in one neatly packaged central user interface. Like always, the dashboard will centralize all of the pertinent information into one place for immediate, colour-coded reference to all areas of concern. And finally, I wanted to point out the threat feed. This is such a cool feature to help stay protected against a number of different, often unforeseen dangers. Here, we can see some suggestions for dealing with potential malware and ransomware attacks, where you can review and act on the recommendations given. So, Hopefully that gives an insight into some of the useful components. And with that, 
I'll hand back over to the conference. Thank you very much, Dan. Uh, still hard to believe that all that comes in a single agent to deliver all that power, but um, either way, that's what Acronis is here developing. Um, well, excellent. We've got one more panel here. I know we're running kind of up against the hour, but I do want to kick off uh, our final panel session, which is in the manufacturing space, evolving from reactive to proactive defenses against downtime. Real quickly, I'll do introductions for the panel that we got uh, with us today. Uh, our our uh, customer, Mark Johnson, who serves as the um, IT project lead for Boston Scientific, currently is involved in multiple efforts to enhance both cybersecurity as well as the global tool sets for Boston Scientific's uh, manufacturing IT support. Mark's prior roles at BSC include supervising desk side teams and project management within the Windows management and mergers and acquisitions teams. Uh, welcome to the panel, Mark. Also very pleased to welcome uh, Jason Samojan. Jason has been uh, a, uh, an IT analyst supporting process control systems and process automation at Howman Aerospace for 17 years. He's been a certified Apple and Microsoft desktop support technician for over 20 years and a Commodore 64 and Amiga enthusiast since way back in 1984. Uh, our third panelist is uh, Isvet Lacostra. Uh, he's principal at Infologic Group, serving for over 20 years as a system integrator focused on delivering IT services, including data protection, disaster recovery, cybersecurity, and many of the world's most valuable brands uh, across verticals like pharmaceuticals, biotech, medical, utilities, and critical infrastructure. Uh, gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us today and uh, look forward to your contributions to the panel questions that we've got today. So without further ado, we'll kick it off here uh, with a stat. We love stats here in our, in our virtual conferences. Essentially, this is saying 44% in the manufacturing space uh, can see fraction of manufacturing industry with no dedicated cybersecurity budget. That's per the Wall Street Journal this year. So the question to the team, uh, and Mark, we'll probably kick it off to you first. Manufacturing has been a favorite target of ransomware, cyber criminals in recent years. What steps have you taken specifically to um, address this particular malware threat? And what other cybersecurity threats uh, keep, you, keep you up at night? Sure, sure. Um, in my environment, you can find that we have basically multiple manufacturing sites running fairly independently of one another. And when you start having a more global cyber threat, the first thing we did is we stepped up and tried to figure out how to view and how to protect these sites globally, right? How to protect them as a unit versus all individually. So what we've done is we've really stood up and actively went in and tried to create relationships with uh, our IT security, our infrastructure and our manufacturing teams who've basically existed in vacuums, you know, with each other. And uh, so what we've done is we've gone through and um, Basically, we're looking at a higher degree of security enforcement. So we're going in and basically doing a lot more remediation work within our manufacturing sites. Um, and uh, basically, we also, our, uh, our disaster recovery efforts are really a big deal for us too. That's not so much a, a remediation of a, uh, 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 a problem that we've got. It's more of a something you fix after the fact, but we're having that automated uh, backup is a big deal for us um, so that they can basically let that stuff run, set and forget. And if there is a problem, they can bring it up quickly, um, getting into like the downtime issues. Um, and uh, we're also looking into quite a few uh, defense in depth kind of things, uh, segmentation, uh, virtual endpoints, things like that, that we can help and have more control with. Um, moving forward um, from a specific threat. I don't really see any specific threat that keeps me up at night. There's so many out there. Um, I would say what worries me the most is the idea of the attacks on our legacy equipment because we do have a lot of legacy equipment in our, our environment, right? So old obsolescent uh, operating systems that we're trying to protect, so. Very interesting. Yeah, I mean, I guess uh, the threats are so constant and, and in front of you all day, they're kind of like that warm blanket you're sleeping. I guess it's, it's job security for you, making sure that you're addressing these on a daily basis. Um, we'll pivot slightly. I mean, if, Isvet, from your perspective, obviously, um, you know, being a system integrator, you know, what, what's your viewpoint from your angle and, and how you're working on, on these particular items? 
Thanks, Pat. Uh, for sure, uh, like uh, all we have in, in the uh, manufacturing landscape, we have to deal with uh, not only the current most uh, best operating systems of today, we have to even support systems that could be uh, over 15 or 20 years old on, on some of those uh, uh, manufacturing or utilities areas. Uh, our team has provided guidance to support and deploy data integrity solutions. Uh, uh, with hardware agnostic uh, 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 perspective, following 321 rule, which is uh, backup of the backup and the replica, uh, but now uh, demonstrating a, a, the protection of those critical systems uh, in a way, uh, either, either physical or virtual, because we know that in manufacturing, uh, we, we can benefit from those hybrid uh, uh, manners of delivering services. The, the point of view is there, uh, taking care of those backups and having them in a uh, continuous uh, automation process, but testing them and also providing these uh, manufacturing lines or production lines with a, uh, let's say, a disaster recovery host, uh, either on-prem or on a hybrid model, where we can continuously test those backups for their efficiency to help guarantee uh, critical systems configurations and of course uh, on those highly regulated uh, areas in the medical or pharma, uh, having those systems uh, uh, logs uh, to have the history of what's really happened throughout that manufacturing uh, process because of pharmacopeia or FDA highly regulated uh, 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 scenarios. And imagine uh, if we include automation, we include orchestration and we also feed uh, the, uh, the, the caretaker of those SOPs, those special operating procedures, the tools to uh, understand that uh, tools like Cronus uh, can help you throughout the life cycle of uh, compliance. Uh, and not only in wording or in writing, but also the executor, let's say the system owner, uh, to be uh, more confident with knowing that they have a tool that is doing its job and can be uh, tested in an isolated environment, uh, either with physical or virtual environments, uh, bringing them the, uh, how do we say, a chance to sleep better at night uh, when disaster uh, attacks, uh, you have a way to bring out, like Sergey uh, previously mentioned, uh, not in hours or days, but cut off that uh, uh, recovery point objective to have uh, the capability to do it in a recovery point objective uh, easier way, if you could say. Excellent. Yeah, I think uh, that's actually a good transition. And Jason, we'll go to you for the next question here to kick us off here. Uh, you talk about time, you talk about downtime. Manufacturing has some of the highest you know, impact costs for being down. If you're uh, an automobile manufacturing company and you're not building cars and shipping them out, that means you're not selling them. So process control, process automation, proper procedures are obviously critical. Uh, Jason, can you comment on you know, how organizations are reducing downtime, especially for real-time process control-oriented systems? Yeah, of course. Uh, you know, obviously, it's critical to have a solid backup of all your uh, automation machines and your critical machines. And you just have to take note of those and, and make, sh make sure you understand that uh, each one of those machines, if it's down, that's thousands of dollars uh, per minute, per hour. So uh, any good organization would recognize that fact. So by having uh, a solution in place like Cronus, which has worked out really, really good for us because uh, simplicity, that's come up uh, quite a few times in this uh, call. It, it's, it's really simple with us because we can, we can get in there, we can look at the logs, we can, we can check the backups, we can install the software remotely, and we can comfortably feel that uh, that system is being backed up uh, on a secure drive in-house. Uh, and we don't have to worry about uh, if, if it's gonna fail two or three o'clock in the morning, then uh, one of our techs could come in and we can get in there, we can, be, we can have that machine back up and running very quickly and we can be back home to our family, you know, comfortably get back up in the morning, come into work, you know, we're not stressing out, you know, we sometimes we got to put that extra hour in for the company, but uh, we're not here all night, you know, we're back home and we're with our families and things are good. And we feel good coming in the next day, knowing that those systems on the shop floor 
are being backed up and uh, it's, it's just been a really good solution and security for us. Cool. Uh, great insight there. Uh, Mark, anything to add from a BSCI perspective? I could say um, with the pandemic uh, in our midst, the getting folks in to do support on machines from a vendor perspective can be difficult right now. So we've put a great deal of effort into uh, some of the remote control tools that we've been utilizing that will allow folks in where before they would be physically in. Now we want to get them in virtually and we want to make sure we're keeping ourselves as secure as possible while we're doing that. Um, Pre-COVID, we were very uh, hit and miss. We had a lot of different types of scenarios, lots of different types of vendors and tools that we were using. Um, and we're kind of settling down into one and, and that's actually proven to be very valuable for getting folks at those machines remotely quicker, faster, thus, you know, less downtime. Very good. Um, is that obviously you're working in, in with customers across different industries. Do you have any insights there? Any specific verticals where you've seen this be a, a real big concern from their side? Obviously costs are important everywhere, but particularly during the pandemic, uh, it can be challenging. Indeed, indeed. And we have uh, observed, uh, of course, the the integrity of our manufacturing uh, uh, hands or manufacturing uh, arms in, in the U.S. and globally, uh, we, we support companies uh, in, in, in different uh, geolocations. And what we've seen is that tools that Acronis delivers uh, uh, to protect and to help recover if we need to, uh, Acronis has always uh, provided us with more than one way to apply a solution or to uh, protect us uh, from threats. And uh, the tool uh, provides today's means of booting up systems that are physical or virtual uh, with uh, bootable medias. Uh, uh, we can uh, take care of images uh, and uh, like Johnson, uh, just, sorry, Jason and Mark were mentioning, we have to do it not only physical because most of those manufacturing plants today are following much stricter uh, uh, protocols because of COVID. And they wanna uh, limit the, let's say, the outside uh, team players uh, from uh, coming into those uh, physical manufacturing line members, uh, taking care of those HMIs uh, that are actually producing uh, medicines or uh, 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 supporting tools for taking care of, of, of people. And what we've seen is that uh, Acronis provides in a very unique manner, uh, very uh, sure, because he's, Acronis has been doing it for decades. Uh, where we can uh, ask someone, a smart hands-on uh, uh, operator or instrumentalist uh, at the site of that specific controlled manufacturing environment, and we can guide them uh, via a script or we can guide them with just delivering to them a boot media that already has the where to look for the data, how to restore it, if we, we will need to reboot the machine, uh, supporting SOPs that uh, for the most parts, they're already in place. A five page uh, document uh, that says what, when, where, and how, uh, we can now have that smart hands-on HMI operator uh, run down with that five page document that it's uh, uh, specifically to that environment, execute. But in the event that we need to assist them, if we have a, 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 the capabilities to remote in to the Acronis uh, console, uh, the web console, either hosted or uh, 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 in a hybrid model, we can drive and we can give uh, uh, an added value of our experience and uh, delivered, uh, how would we say, a most safer uh, peace of mind to that operator uh, so that we can support the activity of uh, recovering a system or even uh, uh, sharing with them being a uh, 
co-pilot. They are the pilot. We can be their co-pilot in the same uh, uh, situation, making it uh, a more smoother uh, way to execute the task and uh, assure that success will be delivered. Excellent. Yeah, I think that's, that's a, a good response there. The, um, you know, the common themes that I'm hearing here, not, not staying up at night, being able to get home to your families, having standard processes that are able to be followed to a T to make sure that your operations are back up and running. Companies still making money and everybody's still collecting a paycheck. Um, critically important, obviously, during these, these difficult times. Uh, we'll move on to question three. Uh, process control and automation tech presents unique data protection and cybersecurity challenges. How will you defend purpose-built systems against cybersecurity and other threats co to continuous uptime? Mark, do you want to take us out to start on this question? Sure. Again, this kind of plays back into that idea of a legacy system that's using quite a bit of a validated machinery, right? So um, you've got a line out there with a bunch of machines that you really can't do much to. Um, it's running, it's doing what it's going to do. So how do you protect it and what do you do? We've been utilizing a lot of the IIoT type devices to do almost like an add-on to the machine. So we're not changing the machine and how it functions. We're taking like, let's call it a camera connected to some kind of a device that can communicate out whatever you're looking to communicate out, right? Um, and then you can monitor and you can watch what's coming out of that device and you can actually do some additional monitoring on a machine without actually physically changing the machine. That's one way we're doing it from a, not so much the cybersecurity perspective, but from a uptime perspective, right? Make sure that the machine's actually running when it's supposed to be running. It hasn't stopped for whatever reason. And if it does, you get an alert, you can quickly go down and try to get that fixed. Um, from a cyber cybersecurity perspective, we're trying to do some hot swaps of certain things. Like I mentioned, the uh, um, the virtual endpoints, we've got certain machine types that are just there for sign off capability. So all you do on a machine would be a user sign off. We can try to do some things virtually where you can make those machines much more protected because it's a virtual machine and it makes it kind of a hot swappable machine as well. So if there's a problem with the physical zero client, if you will, you can pull it and replace it and you're good to go. Those are some of the things that we're doing um, at Boston Scientific. Excellent. Uh, Jason, how's your organization dealing with these challenges? Yeah, I think uh, obviously by having a strong security infrastructure, you don't want to have any problems get to the manufacturing environment. And we've been very fortunate here by, by being proactive and not letting those threats uh, get to our shop floor. Uh, for one example, limiting uh, USB drives, uh, limiting drive access, who, have, who has access to those computers, uh, locking down those machines through policies, right? There's a million different things. But, uh, you know, things, problems do happen. Uh, hardware failures happen. Uh, hard drives crash. Uh, things, things happen. And that's it. And I think just by having a good backup, uh, constant backup solution in place all the time, 24-7, uh, is just going to stop a lot of those problems uh, from continuing. And, and uh, that's pretty much, uh, it, it's going to cause a lot less problems in the future. Excellent. Yeah, well, actually hit on. Um, you know, the access point um, and allowing people access to actually get on the floor. Obviously, some of these machines are very specific. They run very specific mm -hmm. operations. Um, they might have, uh, you know, a, a wide range of operating systems. But either way, uh, if we move on to the next question is that we'll start with you on this one uh, around tech staffing. This is a common theme in this virtual conference today, but uh, 3.5 million is the number of cybersecurity positions that will go unfilled worldwide into 2021. Uh, that's per cybersecurity ventures. Um, local plant level support for IT operations and cybersecurity remains a cost and complexity challenge. How do you efficiently and effectively respond to factory floor downtime incidents, whether from hardware failure, operator error, cyber attacks? How does, um, how does your organization help uh, support that? Is that? Well, sorry, go ahead. No, no go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, you know, I, I was just gonna say it really just takes a team. It's a team effort thing. And it's not just an individual thing. Uh, you got to rely on everybody. You got to rely on your systems, your software, your hardware, uh, you know, everybody from the back end doing the patches, the security updates uh, to the, the infrastructure and, and everything, even even your shop floor manufacturer, your uh, managers and whatnot. So it really takes a strong team to watch out for that stuff and to keep the uptime 
uh, communicate that uh, those problems, if you can, to prevent those problems uh, so you have good uptime. Excellent. Is that anything to add there? Indeed, 100% uh, with, with Jason's point of view. And also, as Mark previously mentioned, uh, it's a cohesive effort because uh, some of these systems might be uh, uh, isolated in their own networks, where uh, probably the physical access is the most carrying off so that we don't deliver or bring on something to that system that could be uh, frozen in time. When we say frozen in time, we can have systems in there that we just can't really uh, be uh, modifying because they are uh, validated environments, but yet we can uh, help them uh, and support them through their life cycle and conditions of, of probably not saying a living thing because it's a machine, but uh, through their life cycle, uh, empower them through a motherboard will go bad, a hard drive will go bad. Uh, some of these systems, uh, we can do a physical to virtual conversion and we can still serve uh, historians, uh, vectors, collectors in those uh, manufacturing lines. But imagine uh, when an HMI, one of those machines has uh, actually attach the laser machine that uh, delivers the, the, the precise uh, 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 texture or modification to a tablet uh, that needs to be consumed uh, by a human and be more effective, uh, how are you going to virtualize that? So sometimes it's a little bit uh, of, of how the HMI, uh, what's the HMI's role in the floor, uh, manufacturing floor. So uh, uh, sometimes keeping them frozen in time, talking about systems, Windows 2000, XP's, uh, I can, I, I even have some NT4's still out there, uh, mm. working in beautiful manner. Uh, and, uh, but we are aware that they are so exposed to the decades ahead that we are today from where they were inception in their inception process uh, that knowing that Acronis has supported them through all this transformation age. I have systems that we have migrated from Acronis Echo, from Acronis 10, uh, and so on to today's evolution of cyber backup, uh, Acronis cyber backup. Uh, so uh, it's, it's, it's beautiful to have a technology that is ready for the manufacturing uh, industry that has always been in there, that has been able to integrate with uh, OEMs like Toshiba, Alan Bradley, and name it all around uh, throughout the world. And so it's, it's, uh, we always enhance, oh, how do we say no in sense? We, we always ask people to uh, foresee how Acronis enhances their disaster recovery and how it supports uh, systems throughout the life cycle, following the three, two, one rule, bringing automation. Uh, you know, you're speaking with experts like Mark and Jason that are there supporting uh, this uh, manufacturing lines where they need to meet targets, where there's very little time for hiccups on, on, on not meeting date, uh, uh, delivery times. So it's, uh, it's amazing. It's amazing to, to have a hardware agnostic platform that today, when we can, can support uh, the systems throughout their life cycle. Either they are restricted because they're frozen in time and we can validate it and we don't apply too many changes to them. But in every year or every two years when these uh, lines come down uh, for upgrades that we can still say Acronis has your back, your cyber fit. Excellent. We'll, we'll take that sound bite. Um, yeah, I mean, it, 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 these are complex environments. They're different types of hardware. You're operating with different types of operating systems. You guys referenced, you know, NT. I saw Jason shaking his head. Yeah, we got to support that too. So uh, having the backwards compatibility and the flexibility of solution is certainly key to this stuff. Let's move on to the next question. Um, the uh, question number five, obstacles to cybersecurity automation. 43% fraction of businesses um, lacking in-house expertise to implement cybersecurity automation, uh, Proponimon Institute 2020. 
how and where are you planning to apply automation to cybersecurity and IT operations? Mark, I think this would be a good one for you to, to take a bite off first. So one thing, one thing that we're starting to look at right now, um, sometimes when you want to do scanning or monitoring from a cybersecurity perspective on a device, it's very difficult when you're doing manufacturing machines because the introduction of that client that sits on that device could slow that machine down enough where it's no longer valid and you're not meeting your, your purpose for it. So we started looking at a, a process of what's called um, uh well, of course, the last remind here, uh, passive scanning, where we, what you would do is you would take a scanner, you put it up on the switch um, in your closet, and you kind of passively scan looking for some of these big bads like your blue keeps and your deja blues and things like this um, without having any impact to the actual device on the line or the machine. Um, we've just started getting into this. Um, of course, we're kind of finding some false positives, things like that. You have to work through and have an understanding of what it's actually collecting. But I think it's promising in this idea of having a, a passive scanner that actually monitors the traffic um, more at the switch level and away from the endpoint. Um, it's not perfect, but it does give you something where you might have nothing from before. Excellent, thank you, Mark. Uh, Jason, how about from a from an aerospace perspective, um, applying automation and like cybersecurity and IT operation? How's, how's your organization dealing with this challenge? Yeah, obviously, you know, we're looking at that constantly. Uh, every organization is, you know, how how can you automate things to make it easier uh, on your company? Uh, to get the reports uh, faster and smarter, uh, the dashboards and all that stuff. So I, I think moving forward, we're, we're definitely, as a company, we're looking uh, more and more into that. Um, me, I'm boots on, so I'm at the shop floor level, kind of in the trenches, making sure everything's up and running. But I know there's been a lot of talk and discussion about you know getting, that, uh, getting more and more tools that are available uh, to us, to the techs, uh, to the uh, IT managers and whatnot. But uh, certainly uh, having having uh, all the, the proper uh, tools in place uh, would help us uh, uh, prevent things from happening and um, whatnot. But because of the sensitivity of our data, uh, I, I think a lot of our stuff is uh, a lot of hands-on still, but we're definitely, uh, we look at that all the time. Yep, hands-on, uh, you know, the, the air gap networks, the yep. not touch the internet, obviously that, that can solve a lot of- Yep, very important. Work. That's for you. Um, why don't we, why don't we move into our tips and tricks? I know we're running a little bit over on time here and I wanted to make sure we spent some, some of our session on this. Uh, each of you guys provided some tips and tricks relative to, uh, this session here. We've got the quotes here. I know you guys go much more in depth in your actual knowledge of this, uh, this topic. Um, Mark, why don't we stop with you, start with you. You're saying take the time and effort to foster true relationships between manufacturing IT security and infrastructure teams, this sounds like a very challenging thing to do, Mark. It is, it is, and that's the role they created for me, right, to sit there and to do this work. But in my experience in manufacturing, manufacturing operates in a silo versus your IT security team and your infrastructure. They all have different drivers and goals and things that they want to accomplish. And a lot of times they will, I like to say, teach them how to talk to each other and not through each other, right? Because once you get a full understanding of what each group and each team is actually trying to accomplish, it makes utilizing these new tools and these new processes that much more easier because you have a better understanding of what each group is actually trying to do. Um, and that's kind of what I was getting at with that tips and tricks. Just uh, instead of, you know, working against or, parallel with someone kind of meld it a little bit do your best to make sure you are fully understanding what each group is trying to accomplish and then figure out that happy medium to how you can accomplish it right so yeah. that's what i was getting at there very simple statement but much harder in practice than implementation i know when brian was talking in, a, in the previous panel session the vp for uh the red sox he talked about you know everybody being involved in this process it's not the CISO, it's not the, you know, manufacturing right. team, it's not the IT security team, you know, everybody takes a part of it down to every employee. Uh, they have to be part of that effort. Uh, Jason, your uh, tip here, backup often, check your backups and allocate the proper amount of time to manage them. Can you expand well, on that? 
Yeah, pretty basic. But, uh, you know, I think it's kind of a lifelong effort, um, even with our home environments, uh, backing up your personal data. You know, what what is data to us and, and where where is that data going uh, long term? You know, your family photos, for example, you know, what you know, how how are you going to preserve those moving on? So so that's kind of one side of it. It's like you should be always thinking about everybody being digital, so digital today. We should be really backing up our stuff uh, in some shape or form, but not not just at home, but also in manufacturing, you know, where, where can we save time? Uh, we should be working smarter, not harder. Uh, and let's let the computers, that's why we built them. Let's let the automation stuff do the work for us. We can kick back, have fun in life, do cool things, not just sit in front of computers and electronics. You know, let's get out there and do real things in life. Yeah, absolutely. Our, our digital footprint, our digital fingerprint will be here long after we all yep. turn to dust. Yep. Um, so it is important that that data is protected uh, into longevity. Uh, Isvet, maybe uh, two minutes from you on uh, your, your tip here. Data integrity, data availability, system configuration integrity are all achievable, but require awareness, agnostic tools, automation, and education by a continuous improvement model. Anything to add to that comment? I, I can support uh, Mark and Jason in their thoughts. Uh, each within uh, the, the perspective of the systems uh, where they reside. And, and uh, uh, like, like Mark was just saying before, uh, uh, bring thoughts, bring care into a process. Uh, Mark was, uh, I believe he's saying build bridges or, or give them uh, 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 secure tokens so that they know that their private key is is secured <laughs> when teams are speaking that feel feel that they work uh, for the same team uh, and and uh, try to listen to them out because they have their own uh, uh, our own point of view on how they should run and so uh, it's uh, it's amazing to to work with teams like that and, and find ways to us human beings to really communicate what is important and how to achieve a common goal. But going back, uh, I think that the continuous improvement model via education uh, of us uh, is important because we are the one who can help make some of those automation rules uh, really execute or really provide service. Uh, of course, we're going to have uh, uh, or we already have uh, AI building into some of these uh, uh, elements. Uh, but on those systems where we are working with process engineers, uh, with uh, uh, highly regulated environments where uh, 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 touching configurations and acting upon them has a, a little bit of more of a, a thought process, uh, time consuming to then identify uh, if we can uh, need to do a remediation or, or a change. Uh, the issue is data integrity. Uh, we can achieve it. We can work together. Uh, tools that don't have, uh, or what do we say? Tools that don't limit you. Tools that enable you to act upon needs. So uh, uh, we all come from an era where imaging systems, endpoints, servers, uh, there was one or two solutions out there. Acronis evolved and started making and delivering uh, uh, true uh, or delivering true value through the years and decade. Plus, by imaging, being an imaging solution, uh, the evolution in time, uh, we can still use this phrase of data integrity where today we see uh, uh, much uh, a, a louder uh, request. Uh, it's a higher amplitude of, of, of volume or, or a voice coming out saying data integrity. So uh, uh, Acronis delivers uh, that, that, uh, that uh, slipping uh, uh, pill that we could take to, or, or, or technique that will make us uh, uh, go sleep uh, better at home at night. Uh, being uh, knowing or, or being uh, capable of act upon what is uh, presented to us in a in a failure, in a in a uh, remediation problem, uh, knowing that you have a tool that gives us more than one way to satisfy a need or or to act upon Murphy. Murphy coming in and, and, and doing a little bit of, of its play with our systems, if we want to call it that way. Excellent. 
Thank you, Isette. Um, we've got a couple of questions here. Uh, we'll try to, to breeze through these. We did get a few questions. Uh, for Mark, has Boston Scientific struggled to, at all to maintain operations under the current pandemic environment? No, not really. Um, they've actually done quite well. The, the biggest concern or issue that we've had at Boston Scientific was the before mentioned, getting that vendor in to take a look at that PC, PLC or something like that. Where and During the pandemic times, you can't get them in there to actually do the looks. We have to figure out a way to get them in remotely and securely. That was probably our biggest effort at that point is making sure we can get that done for everybody across the globe because we do have manufacturing plants across the planet. So um, other than that, we've done quite well. Um, we had a great IT team that actually, you know, allowed us to folks to work from home almost instantly. Um, so that went very seamlessly. So uh, other, other than, other than the uh, getting the vendors in remotely, um, we didn't really have much of a hiccup. Excellent. Um, probably got time for one more question here. Um, Jason, why don't we pass this one to you? Um, what's the most challenging aspect of keeping operations up and running during the pandemic? Yeah, you know, I, I agree a lot with Mark. You know, we had a difficult time getting the vendors in, um, you know, with the, and with the change of the PPE, uh, everybody having to wear masks and facial shields. Uh, you know, it really made things difficult uh, working together uh, close, we're, what we're used to one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, you know, we'd, we'd work very closely together on the shop floor, having to work with the engineers, the electricians, whatnot. But, uh, you know, I think everybody did a really good job, um, uh, you know, following the proper protocols so that uh, the, the pandemic, the illness wouldn't spread uh, within the company. So, you know, I think um, just... Um, working together and uh, being able to work remotely and uh, figure that out as quick as we did and, and so many other companies out there globally, it's, just, it's remarkable seeing everybody work from home. Uh, it's just, it's, it's almost mind boggling. Don't, don't give humans challenges. They'll find solutions and yeah. they, we, will, we will always figure out a way to get back to work. So uh, that's excellent. <laughs> I really appreciate your guys' time today. Um, I, we do have a number of questions still here. I can see in the chat. Uh, some great questions. We will follow up personally uh, with those questions and answers to them, provide additional information and resources to everybody that joined this, uh, this session today, this virtual conference. Wanted to give a special thanks to all of our panelists today, uh, Mark Johnson, Jason Zemojin, uh, Isved Lacastra. Thank you all very much. I'm going to do a quick, probably two minute wrap up here. We'll, we'll skim through a couple of slides here about some important things that are upcoming specifically for Acronis. So if you'll bear with us for another two minutes, we will we'll get through these. We've got a major event coming up. We've got thousands of registrants already, some fantastic speakers. Our Cronus Global Cyber Summit 2020 will be taking place 100% virtual, October 19th through 21st. Please go and register today at cronus.events slash summit 2020. If you need more information, shoot us an email at cronusevents at acronus.com. We've got a lot of assets that can support the stuff we discussed today, provide more detail to you. Uh, case studies from Johnson Electric, Stratosphere Quality, and Rust-Oleum. A lot of great resources on our website are available to you. You heard Frank talk earlier from IDC. Well, guess what? We got all the big guys, IDC, Forrester, Frost, and Sullivan, providing a lot of tech industry report information. If you want detail, this is, is all available for you on our website, and there's links here where we'll share with you after the event. Um, Go today and download CyberProtect. As I referenced earlier, CyberProtect 15 will be launching later this month. We still have the beta open. So if you want to get an early preview, please go to our website and download the free trial. We'd love to hear your feedback on how the solution works and how it solves everyday challenges for you. Um, and beyond that, just want to say again, thank you all so much for joining. If you do have an opportunity, check out our, our foundation. It does provide some much needed things for um, less fortunate people across the world who have been, you know, adversely impacted certainly by the pandemic. Uh, we have a, an emergency relief fund that has been established. So if you do have the opportunity, every dollar helps, please go to the Acronis Foundation uh, for more information and to donate. Thank you all again so much. We really appreciate your time and attentiveness to this, this virtual conference. And thanks again to all of our wonderful panelists. Goodbye and have a great day and go download CyberProtect 15. Thank you.